Good evening, everyone. We usually start on time, but the commission has been given some correspondence late. Um, so as we arrive, we're um, going to read a few things. To, so we have uh, had a chance to take in all the public comment, some of it delivered to us just now as we arrive. anything that wasn't emailed to us? The handwritten letter that's on top is the only thing that you were not e emailed. Say that again? The handwritten letter is the only thing you weren't emailed.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Welcome to the May 16th, 2019 regular, uh, regular meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission. We'll call the meeting to order and ask for a roll call, please. Commissioner Schifrin? Here. Conway? Here. Salmon? Here. Nielsen? Here. Greenberg? Singleton? Here. Chair Pepping? Present. And Commissioner Greenberg is uh, on her way. She has shared with us. Are there any statements of disqualification for any of the agenda items tonight? Yes, I don't know if I'm disqualified, but I'm gonna abstain on item number three, the 2929 Mission Street. I'm on the board of the Santa Cruz Housing Authority, which is the owner of the property. And while I have no financial interest, um, in order to avoid any perception of bias, I'm gonna abstain on that item. You'll join us for the conversation, but not vote? Or will you step out? Um, it's on the consent agenda. I don't know if there will be conversation, but I will not participate in the conversation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any, any others? Um, next on our agenda item is, uh, next on our agenda is oral communications. So we will invite you, uh, members of the public, thank you for coming, to share your comments on anything that is on the agenda. And this section is to share your comments with the commission for anything that is not on the agenda tonight. So welcome and come up um, and address the commission for any anything that falls into that category. Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the approval of the minutes. I'd um, entertain a motion for approval of the May 2nd meeting. I, um, I'm happy to move the minutes, but I did remember I wanted to ask the commission. I. Uh, as I remember it, my motion included dropping the quote generally 15 minutes language from oral communications. Do other people remember that? I thought that was part, it is not reflected in the minutes, but um, I think that was uh, part of my motion. So if there's no objection, I'd move the minutes uh, and with that change. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. It passes unanimously. The minutes are approved. The next agenda item is uh, consent agenda items two and three. Would anyone like to pull these items for discussion? I, I just have a question on item number two, which is the DNA Comedy Club. Uh, the staff report mentions that there are going to be security cameras as part of the operation, but it doesn't say how many uh, hours they'll be operating. Uh, is the intention that they're going to be 24 hour uh, security cameras there or just while it's uh, the club is open? Okay. Yeah, we have the applicant and the planner here. What I recommend is also seeing if there's anybody from the public that wants to pull any of these and then it'll be up to you as to where you want to put them in the public hearing okay. schedule. And right. we can certainly address your question if that's all you I want. I don't really on that. need to pull it. I'm yeah. a, I okay. don't have any problem with the recommendation. I just had that question. So items two and three, we will vote as a, on consent unless um, members of the commission or members of the public, you can pull this if you'd like us to discuss it. Otherwise we'll vote. Anyone want to pull either of these items? 155 River Street South, the Comedy Club, and 2929 Mission, the Total Fitness Expansion. Have three references to Come on up to the mic. Come on up to the mic so everyone can hear you. Good evening. I'm Mike Pappas. I'm the co-owner of DNA's Comedy Lab. We have eight cameras throughout the, uh, the lab right now. You can see the outside throughout the doors, one in each of the theaters that show all the way through and through the exits. And so there's a total of eight cameras. The cameras are on 24 seven. And then we are also putting uh, floodlights all around the building. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And hours of operation on the Genesis is 12 to 12, but will be closed before midnight. And usually shows start around seven, they're about 90 minutes shows. Thank you. Okay, all in. the consent agenda. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye, but I abstain on item number three. Okay. Any opposed? So those pass unanimously with Commissioner Schiffer and abstaining for the portion of item number three. Is that clean enough? <coughs> when you break it out? I think you can. Yeah, we might have a separate motion on 
comedy club versus um, 29 29. Plenty of times people make motions and then vote no on yeah, them. Yeah, I so think we're clean I would there. assume that okay. we could make a motion and abstain on it as well. You advise us to do otherwise? Okay, that's all right. Sure? Okay. All right. Um, okay, the next um, agenda item is under general business, and we have a staff report, I believe, for the capital improvement program and its consistency with the 2030 general plan. Great, good evening, Chair, Commission members, thank you for having me. My name is Sarah Fleming and I am Principal Planner uh, overseeing the Long Range Planning and Policy team where this topic falls. And so I am here today to present to you staff's findings on the 2020 through 2024 Capital Improvement Program and its consistency with our General Plan 2030 and recommend um, a recommendation for Planning Commission as well. So the reason that we're here is that state law requires that there is a conformance review between the general plan and the capital improvement program each year. And um, what we need to determine is that a project is consistent with this general plan if it will further the objectives and policies of the plan and not obstruct their attainment. So the general plan is really the city's blueprint. It is the overarching policy document of the city um, that all of the implementation tools fall under. So the policy is set at the general plan level and then the implementation tools such as specific plans, area plans, zoning ordinances, things of that nature all then enact the policies in this plan. So um, the state mandates, I believe now it's eight elements that must be in general plans. Uh, jurisdictions can decide if they so choose to add additional elements the city of Santa Cruz has decided to do that. We do have a couple that aren't required here. But you can see here, we have policies related to topics of housing, historic preservation, arts and culture, community design, land use, mobility, economic development, civic and community facilities, hazards, safety and noise, parks, recreation and open space, and natural resources and conservation. So when we look at each of these uh, CIP items, we wanna look at the conformance with and the consistency with those topics in the general plan. So the 2020 to 2024 Capital Improvement Plan, or CIP, um, for the purposes of this analysis, we break it into three categories. So we have new projects. These are projects that um, have not yet been analyzed uh, for any sort of consistency. So those are the ones we'll be looking at today. We have three that we'll be looking at. Um, there's ongoing and carryover projects. So as you can see, this is a multi-year CIP. And so usually these are very large projects that don't get completed in one year. And so there um, are, are, are funding implications over multiple years. For these ongoing and carryover projects or in the CIP, you'll see they're referenced as existing projects. Um, they've undergone review in a prior year. So we won't be talking about those today. And then any maintenance or improvements to those existing facilities as those maintenance and improvement efforts are ancillary to the original uh, facility, those have been considered to have been reviewed under a previous CIP. What did I do? There we go. Okay, so now uh, I put together this consistency matrix to try to make it as easy as possible to see what the project is, what department it falls under, where you can find it in your um, capital improvement plan document, or uh, the draft one that you have now. Um, the a selection of related general plan 2030 goals, policies, and actions related to those projects that would uh, make them consistent, and then whether staff has found um, and recommend them to be consistent or not. So the first one we have here is a Mission Street Improvement Plan. This falls under the uh, Public Works Department umbrella, and you can find this on page 67, although that might be a mistype. I think it's actually page 66 of your CIP if you have that in front of you and are looking at it. And um, the two main elements that this is covered by would be our mobility um, element and our uh, natural resources and conservation element. So in mobility, we talk about having land use patterns, street design, and access solutions that facilitate multiple transportation alternatives. And we talk about safe, sustainable, efficient, adaptive, and accessible transportation system. So the Mission Street Improvement Plan is um, in our environmental impact report for the general plan itself, there are mitigation measures that help mitigate the impacts of the general plan. And one of those um, mitigation measures in the EIR is um, this 
certain intersections to be improved to facilitate on Mission Street to facilitate the, uh, the plan, general plan growth. And so what this plan would do is it would create a coordinated improvement and implementation plan that would then be the overarching document that would guide those improvements. And so um, with that, and it looks like here based on the CIP, and I'm not the expert on this project, um, but it, it looks like the improvements are gonna be required at Chestnut and King, Laurel, Bay and Swift. And so um, you can see here in the mobility element, we're talking about the land use patterns and sustainable, efficient, adaptive, accessible transportation system. Um, really this type of improvement would allow um, better navigation of uh, bike and ped activity, would allow for um, better facilitation of uh, public transit such as buses. And so really we are providing and accommodating for multiple transportation modes, implementing ped bike, mass transit, road system improvements through the CIP so you can see a direct correlation there. In terms of the natural resources and conservation, goal NRC7 talks about a reduction in energy use. And um, one of the policy or the goals underneath that, or the policies underneath that would be to um, promote the implementation of a circulation system improvements that can reduce local consumption of fossil fuels. And if we're improving our bike ped facilities and improving ways for buses and other transit, alternative transit needs to get through our street navigation, our roadway system, nav navigate a roadway system, we are um, really helping to reduce the dependence on fossil fuels because people are able to use those alt alternative modes of transportation much easier. So for that reason, uh, staff believes that this one is consistent and would recommend um, that one being uh, found as such by the commission. The next one is the Soquel Pine Storm Drain. Um, and this project um, is to alleviate flooding on Soquel Avenue between Pine and Doyle Street by conducting a 30 inch, or constructing a 30 inch pipeline on Pine Street from Soquel Avenue to Broadway. And the approximate linear length would be about 1800 feet. And so for this one, again, it's public works. You'll find it on page actually 87, sorry about that, of your um, document. And this falls primarily under our civic and community facilities element. Um, so our goal CC2 is to have a comprehensive community facilities and services. And we want to make sure we're providing those in keeping with the needs of a growing and diverse population. And um, we're seeing that in this area here, there is not a storm drain currently. There is flooding, and so we need to make that improvement. So that's consistent with that goal. And then goal CC5, a sustainable and efficient stormwater system. So we want to maintain clear flows. We want to strive to contain drainage. You want to design the storm drainage system to um, not cause problems in other basins and reduce stormwater pollution. And so staff believes that these uh, two goals and the CIP project are in conformance. So the next one is the downtown mixed use project. This is uh, sits in the economic development department and can be found on, believe it or not, it's right, page 149. <laughs> that one's right. Um, and so this one hits a few of our, um, of our uh, general plan elements. It falls under housing, economic, and civic and community facilities. Um, and I, I realized that at the last council meeting, I, um, I'm sure most of the commissioners know, there was a um, basically a deferral of the starting of this project because uh, council decided to form a um, subcommittee of the council that will be looking at some of the uh, previous findings and, and determinations made on this garage project uh, and library project and maybe reanalyzing some of those things. So this project is not slated to start right away. However, it is still in the CIP, so we do want to make the consistency findings, even though it might not start right away, if at all. So, um, okay, so the first one, we have the um, housing element. Um, the downtown mixed-use project, I guess I can uh, read to you what this says. It's early, uh, early phase design and development of the downtown mixed-use project to include library, parking, housing, and commercial uses on the city-owned parking lot four. So that's the one at Cathcart. Um, and so housing, an adequate diversity in housing types and affordability levels to accommodate present and future housing needs of Santa Cruz residents. And one of the policies under that goal is to concentrate new housing in the central core, um, as well as along major commercial corridors and on major opportunity sites consistent with the land use element. Uh, goal number two is increased and protected supply of, uh, of housing affordable to extremely low, very low, and moderate income households. And um, this project, um, as currently proposed, would um, 
provide affordable housing. And so um, for that reason, uh, staff feels that it is in compliance with that goal. And then goal six, fulfill the city's housing needs while promoting an environmentally sustainable, compact community with clearly defined urban boundaries. And one of the policies under there is to promote transit-oriented, mixed-use residential developments that are close to services. So um, developing on that site is infill development, and that would um, allow us to, um, and instead of building out in our green belts or in other areas, kind of concentrate that development in the, in the urban core and allow um, a better use of, um, of the site than, it, than currently the, the parking lot that's there now and it's close to services and will help people be able to walk more as opposed to use their cars. So that's the housing uh, items. Economic development, a vibrant and regional economic center that could be determined to be our downtown. And so really there you're talking about encouraging the development of year-round businesses and visitor activities that can attract and engage local residents as well as tourists. Um, implement transportation parking um, and alternative transportation improvements consistent with circulation planning and providing a variety of parking resources to support a diverse retail base. And so um, the other, the next one in ED is uh, diverse and dynamic business districts. So we want to have a downtown as a welcome and inviting destination for residents and create distinctive and active pedestrian environments downtown. So um, based on the plans as um, kind of currently discussed for the downtown mixed use project, staff feels that these are in compliance with general plan. And then finally, civic and community facilities. We want to have excellent educational opportunities and resources for our residents and visitors. And one of the key points of that is to make all library buildings accessible to the physically disadvantaged and the elderly. And um, any new improvements that would be made on that site related to the library would be um, top of the line in terms of ADA access and resources for the community. So with that, staff has evaluated uh, the new projects in the current G, uh, draft CIP, and we've determined that they're consistent with the general plan. And we recommend that the Planning Commission by motion make the following finding, that the Planning Commission finds that the City of Santa Cruz 2020 through 2024 capital improvement plan is consistent with the City's 2030 general plan. And I think actually that's to say capital improvement program is consistent with the general plan. And I'm here for any questions you have related to consistency. Happy to answer if I can. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Mr. Schiffer. Who decides what projects are in the CIP? That's a great question. Um, so there is a, it's a pretty iterative process. Um, at the beginning of the fiscal or the, the development of the new CIP, I think a lot of projects get thrown into the bucket uh, for requests. Not everything gets funded. And um, it, it depends on which fund the money, what the project is slated to come out of, how much money's in that fund, what's already in the queue. And I know that Public Works especially has a uh, host of other kind of, um, prioritization procedures that they put in for their specific projects, but um, really at the end of the day, it's, it's based on a number of factors. What is the role of the city council in the approval of projects in the CIP? So um, this has to happen before the city council adopts the CIP, and that's done as a part of their budget adoption process. So um, it will go forward along with the budget, which is being discussed now. There was a, a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and there will be several more budget meetings, and this is part of that process. Does the City Council have the legal authority to change projects in the CIP? It's probably within their purview. So I'm not the expert, but I would assume that that is, and I would expect that that's within their purview. So essentially, the CIP represents the City, the city Council's decision on what projects they'd like to do over the next um, three years or future years based on recommendations coming from the staff? Um, I would say that, uh, can you uh, repeat that? Because I, I had a thought, but then I lost it with the last part of what you said. So the staff recommends a, CI, a CIP and ultimately it's approved by the city council and the city council as the elected decision makers for the city has the ability to amend the CIP if it wishes to. Um, a, yeah, a uh, sure, sure. I mean, the, the council is the, the decision-making body for the city. So if they adopt it, so say in previous years, there's previously adopted CIPs that staff is currently working on, um, that, that is direction to staff to work on those projects. If they want to change that, that is absolutely their prerogative. So if they change um, their 
a decision about a project that has been in the CIP, would it follow that it might make sense to amend the CIP to reflect the council decision? I'm not sure that I understand your question. Can you provide an example? Yes, I'll provide the example that's before us, the mixed use project. Sure. As you said on Tuesday, the council uh, decided to put that project on hold. That's correct, and yep. To look at alternatives. Yep. As I think the commission knows, and I'm sure staff knows, the project that's in the CIP has been quite controversial. Absolutely. So one of the reasons I think the council decided to put it on hold was to give a chance to look at uh, a range of alternatives. The that's mixed correct. use project may show up at the end, it may not. That's correct. But it seems to me that, that for that process to have integrity, the process of looking at alternatives, the city shouldn't be adopting a, do a document that uh, proposes that the, the, the project that's been put on hold. So I, I, I guess that's where I'm heading, sure. that mm -hmm. it might make more sense, given the council's decision to uh, maybe reword the project description at this time. What we know is gonna happen is it's gonna be a library project. What's mm -hmm. gonna go along with it will, will come after the council makes its decisions. Sure. Um, and so I just am concerned that a process that's starting has integrity and the, the, the city isn't sending a, a mixed message that on the one hand, they're gonna take a fresh look at the alternatives, but at the other hand, the CRP is proposing a project that the council has put on. Hold. Okay, I hear what you're saying. I appreciate your viewpoint. Um, at this point, when we bring this forward, this is the current, most current CIP that we have. And so um, when, we, when I bring this forward to you, I am basing this on the CIP that is in place currently right now, the draft. That's why you're seeing it on here. If council, when they move to finally adopt this, want to make changes to it, that's absolutely their prerogative. Um, that is not um, under our purview, uh, being staff or the planning commission's purview. Um, and so the reason that we have it before you now is because it is currently in the draft CIP that will be going to council. And so it's the responsibility of the planning commission to take a look at that and determine if they feel like it's in conformance with um, the general plan. If they don't, they can recommend that it's not. But at the end of the day, it's the council's responsibility to decide if they want that to move forward or not. So am I understanding you correctly that the, the commission's purview is not to follow the directions of the city council? That is not what I said. Um, the commission's purview is to take a look at the draft CIP, that is the current draft that the city has now. The city has not changed that draft. The finance, there's been no changes to the CIP draft. And so your responsibility is to look at that CIP draft and say, this version that is in place now is either in conformance or not in conformance with the general plan. You're welcome. Uh, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. And to clarify, it's a process they're starting, so they haven't changed the project description yet. At the end of the process, they may. The CIP is a five-year living document. It'll change. When they adopt the CIP, they really only adopt the first year, and that's shown as, you know, with the budget. The following four years are more concept, in a way, and it is your responsibility to see if all those concepts are within the... Um, you know, the city's general plan. Commissioner Schifrin. So are you saying that the council didn't decide to put the mixed use project on hold? Well, they may, but they haven't. Where yeah, I'm, it, I'm just staff asking what the decision staff was won't on work Tuesday. On the project. Staff won't be working on the project if they put it on hold, but they haven't changed the project yet. No, that they haven't right. decided to go forward with the project. Exactly, put it on staff's hold. aware of what the council how they're acting on different projects. And if the project is on hold, staff's gonna put resources towards that project until a decision is made on what the, what the pro ultimate project is gonna be. Okay, thank Other you. than providing information to council as needed. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Any other questions for staff before we hear from the public? So we invite the public to address the commission on this. We'll just be receiving the update from staff. Um, that's about all we'll do is receive the staff report and discuss it. But we welcome you to address the commission on this. Anyone like to address the commission? Okay. Commissioner Schifrin? We're doing more than receiving it. We're, the recommendation is that the Planning Commission find that the 20 to 20, 2024 
twenty to twenty twenty four proposed CIP is consistent with the general plan. So thank we're you. Making thank you for that correction. That it's consistent. Thank you for that correction. With that correction, would any member of the public like to address the commission? To, so it's back to us for a discussion or a motion. Commissioner Greenberg. So my sense is that this uh, the, the um, proposed project that that's in question that has been put on hold. It could be that it's ultimately adopted or it could be that it's tr completely transformed into something else but the draft of the pro of the pro of the proposal for it is that consistent with the general plan or not is the question before us whether or not it's ultimately changed right so i don't know what the concern is exactly mr Schifrin. being a cip is yeah. For a project to be in the CIP, it's a city commitment to do the project. That's why it's in the CIP. If the city wasn't committed mm -hmm. to do the project, it wouldn't be in the CIP. The CIP tries to schedule projects that the city is right. determined to do over a period of time. And um, certainly things can change in future years. But it represents that in a particular year, what the city's commitments are and what projects the city would like to do. And so my concern <coughs> is in a, in, a, in, a, in a context where there's strong feelings on all sides um, and the council has decided in response to those feelings that it wants to take a fresh look at what the options are and put the, the project that staff in good faith, that it is, I'm not denying, it is the project that the, that the council had, to, uh, had uh, decided to go forward with, but they're now saying they're gonna put it on hold and take a fresh look. And I'm just concerned that by including it in the CIP, it's going to look like this means that the council is intent, that the city is intending to do this project. And I think at this point, given the council's action on Tuesday, that's not an appropriate, um, uh, an appropriate project to, uh, as defined, an appropriate project to be in the CIP. So from my perspective, if the project was defined as a downtown library project, that certainly represents where the council is at this time, where the city is at this time. I think that's what should be in the CIP. I hope that responds to your question. Commissioner Conway. Uh, I was just going to say that I, um, I, I uh, don't feel that a consistency finding uh, a recommendation for, uh, from us, um, we don't have authority to decide whether the, the project goes or not. And I think we are, um, we have a role in the process right now. The CIP is a very large document. Um, it is a living document and it changes from within every year. Um, it's constantly being reassessed. Um, I have no doubt that the way that this ends up, this is not a funding recommendation. It's not a, a go or no go recommendation in any way that isn't in our, it's not our job. So um, I, I, I feel fine moving the staff recommendation um, to, uh, for the consistency findings. Is your motion? Yes. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Commissioner Conway's uh, move the staff recommendation and Commissioner Nielsen second. Is there any discussion? I would like to um, move to amend the motion on the floor to change the description of the project on the downtown mixed use project, uh, project to state uh, early phase design uh, development of a downtown library. Through the chair, if I may. Um, respectfully, Commissioner Schifrin, that is not within the role or the purview of the Planning Commission to make those changes. So you're saying the Commission either can decide that it's consistent with the CIP as written is consistent, but it can make no, no recommended changes? Um, you could make a recommendation of changes, but if I heard your motion correctly, it sounded like you were recommend you were making a motion to make the change, and that is not within the authority of the Planning Commission. Okay, if you'd like to make I'll a motion to motion. make a recommendation, that would probably be more appropriate. I'd make Thank a mo you. Uh, uh, my motion to amend would be uh, to recommend that the dis project description for the mixed-use project be changed to um, 
early phase design and development of the downtown library. So there is a motion on the floor. I'm, I'm making a motion to amend the motion on the floor. Uh, not a friendly amendment, but a motion to amend. Well, it could be friendly if she'd accept it, but I don't think she will. <laughs> what are you offering? <laughs> what what, what are, you, are you offering? A, are you asking, offering a friendly amendment, or are you making, making a motion? Making amendment to amend. Uh, I'm making a motion to amend the motion on the floor. If I get a second, then that gets voted on first. If right. it passes, the motion on the floor changes. If it fails, the motion on yeah. the floor doesn't. All right. So no one on Is there a second? Let me see if I understand correctly. So, um, Commissioner Shippen, so you feel that if this amendment were, if this were to be added, it would, your concern is about the uh, appearance of, of our uh, decision that this is consistent with the general plan, that that might appear that we were as a commission endorsing a final product as opposed to an early design stage of a, pro of a project. Is that the issue? Well, in a way, yes. Um, what What's being proposed here is a project that from my perspective is currently inconsistent with council action and also um, sends a message that the city is still committed to a very controversial project that the council has put on hold. So my recommendation in this amended motion, and I thank staff for correcting me, is that that be um, changed to be clear that at this, in this CIP this year, that there would not be a project to have a mixed use development as defined in the CIP before us, because it doesn't represent where the council is. And I think it does send uh, uh, an inappropriate message to the public about what the city's position is on this project. So is there a second to the motion to amend? that fails without a second. Is there any discussion of um, the original motion? Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. So the motion passes 6-1 with Commissioner Schifrin um, voting against, um, other commissioners voting for. And that moves us on to the public hearing. Um, next is agenda item 5, 914 and 916 Seabright Avenue. We have a staff presentation. Yeah, Mike Ferry will be giving um, the staff presentation this evening. He's a project planner on this application, and it will need a minute here to get set up. Good evening, Commissioners, Chair. Um, so this project was one of the, um, might have been the first project where we had a community um, meeting, community outreach meeting. We had it at the Pacific Cultural Center. It was last fall. We had about 35 people show up. Um, we start those meetings off kind of describing the city's role. So, you know, I, I explain the, uh, uh, the entitlement process and when the public would be able to uh, attend public hearings and express their uh, views. Um, we also had some uh, design changes that we announced at that meeting that we wanted to see. One was that uh, we thought that the unit closest to Seabright should face Seabright. Um, we also thought that the um, guest parking spaces could be put in the back of the development instead of right in front, which uh, the original plan had. Um, um, we did uh, discuss with the applicant about pedestrian access from Sumner Street through the development onto Seabright. Um, so all of those concerns were addressed by uh, the applicant's letter. I attached that to your staff report. Um, the other item that uh, was pretty consistent with the neighborhood at that meeting was that the building was too tall. Um, didn't fit into the neighborhood, and there was fear that the um, folks on Sumner Street would inherit people from this new development parking on their street and then walking into the development. So that letter from the uh, applicant in response to those um, is attached to your staff report. So the project site's a little over 21,000 square feet. It's outside of the Seabright um, area plan, just north of it, about a block north. It's in what's called the, um, I think it's called the North Seabright area. Um, 
the site was mapped um, as an archaeological sensitive um, area, and we had an archaeologist go out and take a look, and the report came back negative. Uh, there was also some comments at the community meeting that perhaps the houses were historic and they could be maintained and somehow built into this development. We had a uh, historic report done, and the uh, result of that report was neither of them were historic or notable in architecture. And for CEQA purposes, they could be removed. Um, so the general plan designation for the property is low, medium residential. That looks for something between 10 and 20 dwelling units per acre. And this proposal is coming in at 18.4 per acre. Um, the higher end of the density is what we have been aiming at for the last, I don't know, seven or eight or nine years. And um, I've got four of the general plan policies noted in the staff report that direct us to go for the higher uh, end of the density, and that's if there's not environmental resources uh, at stake on the property, and that's the case in, um, in this development. Uh, based on seven, seven general plan policies that I listed in the staff report and four additional uh, policies from the active transportation plan, we've included a condition that does allow public access through that sidewalk area from Sumner to uh, Seabright and back. And I've got some slides where I'll go over all of this. Uh, the frontage improvements that will be required is a 24-foot uh, recessed parking bay on the uh, Seabright side. There will be a um, new driveway entrance on both Seabright and Sumner that meet ADA requirements. There will be a street light out there on Seabright. Um, this project requires uh, 1.3 units to be designated as affordable at 80% of the area median income and that the applicant pay the 0.35% of that uh, as an in-lieu fee. So the homes are uh, three stories. They range in size from about 2,000 to 2,200 square feet. They've each got a two-car garage, a small backyard area. They've got... Um, a uh, balcony area. It meets all the RL zone district standards. They're not asking for exceptions or variances. Um, we did have an issue with uh, the massing of the building um, from the original um, set of plans that came in to today. So we've uh, put a condition of approval in there that tries to break up the massing of the building by the use of different materials, maybe paint colors, that sort of thing. So I'll take you through the pictures. So this is the area. It's you know, right in the middle of uh, Seabright. The uh, actual Seabright area plan ends right here on Clinton Street. So they're outside of that with those really specific uh, guidelines. Uh, the general plan is uh, low, medium, residential. And you can see this whole area around here is the same. These are R15 zone districts, uh, but this is RRL, which is the multiple residential low density. So you can see that from the aerial that there's, looks like there's three units on this uh, property. It looks like there's two here. There's two units, two units, two units, it's surrounded by uh, multiple residential developments. This is the front of the house that's going to be demolished uh, from Seabright Avenue. The house just to the north is about two and a half stories. I don't know what the height is. Um, and then going over to Sumner, this is the um, deeded access or the legal access that this property has on Sumner. You can see the house um, right to the right, single story. The house to the north is single story, a pretty good distance away from where this development will be. And then um, kind of looking around to the east in that cul-de-sac, we can see two stories in the neighborhood, two stories right on the street. But then on the rest of the street uh, going north, those were all single families. So this is the site plan. Uh, all the traffic will enter and exit off of this driveway onto Seabright. There's going to be a, a locked uh, gate at this uh, side, and they'll include a knock box type of a device so that fire and the trash truck 
can get through there, but no other private vehicles will be able to enter and exit on that uh, site. That's the um, pedestrian walkway that we've been talking about. Um, since, since the original plans came in, uh, there's some ADA ramping and guardrails that doesn't show up on uh, some of the uh, elevations that I'll show you in a minute. So I think maybe the um, architect can talk about that. You can see the, the rear uh, backyard areas. Um, they're 10 feet deep. There's uh, second floor balconies that provide the private uh, uh, open space. So they exceed the required 400 square feet of open space by about 90 uh, feet per unit. They meet all the RL uh, zone district standards, the front yard setback, um, the rear yard setback is, the requirement is 10 feet. Looks like they're about 18 feet from the rear property line. What else? Um, we did ask for some enhanced landscaping um, when we first got this. So they're putting as much as they can up in the front. Again, that uh, ramping is gonna take away a lot of opportunity. Um, they've got a um, landscape strip that's, I think it's three feet if I remember uh, right. And they've got a lot of shrubs. They've got climbing vines. There'll be a new six foot tall redwood fence. Um, and then this is a planting area that is now um, in an area where the uh, guest parking is required. So these folks are required to have two parking spaces per unit and then two guest parking spaces for each of the four units. So one for four. One, one for four. Sorry. Sorry. So the ground floor on all of the units, uh, except the front one, is pretty much the same. There's an entry, uh, there's a bathroom, a bedroom, stairs up to the first floor. They reoriented this unit one so that the front door is facing out on Seabright. The uh, second floor is the living area with a kitchen, family room, that sort of thing, half bath. And then the third floor contains two bedrooms. They each have a bath. They each have closets. Uh, there's a laundry area uh, built into that. And then the elevations. So this is the Seabright. Uh, unit one is on the Seabright elevation. And you can, it used to have a, a front porch kind of a setup over here. So that's been rotated around and the front door has been ro rotated to meet Seabright. Um, This would be the unit that was on the east side, the farthest on the east side. Rear elevations, pretty much the same thing, um, except you've got these balcony areas that break that look up a little bit. And then this is the uh, Sumner side, unit nine. So they've got cement plaster walls on the ground floor. They've got this hardy shingle siding on the second and third, and then comp roof material on the top. So, so the, um, I spelled it out in the staff report, the way we measure height. So the city has always done that. They use average heights and average grades. And when you come in at a 30 foot height, the peak of the roof is higher than that quite often. So in this instance, we are, the 30 feet average height, the peak of the roof here is 36 feet. So this is facing Seabright, and this is facing Sumner. Same thing, 30 and 36. So I asked, um, because one of the planning commissioners has consistently asked for um, uh, these perspectives, and it, it didn't come out quite the way I was expecting it. So I kind of can walk you through it. Um, this is the proposed house. The adjacent lot to the south has one of those three units is a, looks like a garage from the front. I didn't walk around in there, but that's the closest unit. And then the two story that, that's to the north, I showed you the picture of, that's the distance that it's located uh, away from this house. And then on the Sumner side, that's even trickier because it's a cul-de-sac. So this is a garage in the back of a unit on Clinton Street 
and this is the adjacent single story that I showed you that was kind of that green color house. And then this is the house to the north. So there's a bit of a separation between those. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm gonna invite the public to address the commission um, in a moment. So please let staff um, make their presentation. So um, we got a shadow study today. Uh, you can see that the shadow doesn't leave the site on the longest day of the year. On the shortest day of the year at 2 p.m., the shadow does go to the adjacent site. That's December 21st. And on December 21st at 10 a.m., it's going over to the site a little bit. So that's going to be the extreme um, day of the year. So I drove up and down the street today and um, I took the pictures. Um, in the staff report, I talked about some of the other developments that have been approved that are um, newer, maybe in the last 15 years along Seabright Avenue. And I kind of described where they were, but these are the pictures. So this particular development, the average height's 28 feet and the peak of the roof is 35 feet. One right next to it is 28 feet for an average height. The peak of that roof is 30 feet. It's a shot of those two together. I forget the exact dates that those were built, probably 2010-ish, uh, I guess. So the recent development is called the Breakers. The average roof height there is 29.5 feet, 29 and a half feet. And the peak of the roof in this uh, development is 33 feet. And then this development, um, I don't know when uh, when that was constructed. Was it 10 years ago, maybe? It was completed about 2009. 2009. So the average height here is uh, 26 and a half feet, and the peak of the roof um, is 30 feet. This lot slopes down off of Seabright. So this is a rendition of what the development will look like. You've got the front porch and the front door. So the ADA ramp and guardrails doesn't show up in here. And another thing that's not really clear is that the elevation at the sidewalk, the difference between the elevation at the sidewalk and the finished first floor is about four feet. So the finished first floor is four feet higher, higher than the sidewalk. So um, we had some pointed questions about the demolition permit. Um, we do regulate demolition. Uh, the purpose is to maintain affordable housing opportunities to protect low and moderate uh, income tenants. Um, both of these, we've got two different um, demolition permit processes and both require uh, income verification if you can't do that, which is often the case because uh, the folks just don't want to go through the paperwork that they have to pay to go through to verify their income, then we assume that it's lower moderate uh, tenants. So the two demo categories that we have um, are the easy one, which is for a single family or a duplex. That was the... Um, the findings that I gave you in your staff report was for a single family and a duplex. So we started to get some questions about that. And then I turned the page from the single family duplex to multi unit demolition. And this is uh, considered multi demolition, even though it's a single family and a duplex. The multi demolition is talks about three or more units. So when that happens, you have to um, not only do relocation assistment, assistance, but replacement housing requirements kick in. So what I handed out to you today, that set of, of uh, findings is a revised set of findings that has the correct demolition uh, findings attached to it. All the other findings are exactly the same. So it's just the demo findings that have changed. 20, 20 onward? I'm sorry? Conditions 20, 4, 20, the, 20, 21, 22? The, 
their findings numbers. And ironically, I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> yeah, so it, it begins with finding number 20. So basically, uh, we've rewritten the findings so that this application will be consistent with not only uh, 1350, but 1390, and that is what covers the replacement uh, housing. And I'm going to walk you through like a worst case scenario on, on what this means uh, with this project. So replacement housing requirements, uh, in this zone district, 50% of the units have to be replaced, and that can be done as a bedroom count. So we haven't walked through the existing units yet, but we're told that there's four bedrooms, a total of four bedrooms, which means they're going to have to replace two of these uh, bedrooms, 50% of those. Um, all the units that are being proposed are three bedroom units. One of them is going to be an affordable unit, and this demolition, um, allows you to use the affordable unit for the bedroom replacement unit as long as it's being rented. So we did uh, speak briefly with the applicant tonight and the intention is to rent the units and he says that the property owners may rent it always. If they sell one of the units, that affordable unit becomes the affordable unit and two replacement bedrooms have to be provided. They can't pay an in lieu fee for more than 50% of them. So somewhere on the site or off site, the bedroom replacement will have to occur according to our regulations, according to the uh, revised findings that we have. So I, I understand this is a complicated um, last minute thing, I apologize for throwing that in. That was just uh, all, all my fault. Um, the plan uh, maximizes infill density. We're surrounded by green belts. Um, we've got um, recommended conditions of approval that require, require that pedestrian easement. We've got conditions to further break up the massing with color and different materials. Uh, we've got condition in there to enlarge some of the little landscape planners so that we can get more specimen type trees in front of the garage. Um, so I think with those uh, findings and, and uh, some of those conditions, uh, we can make the findings to support the design permit. So we're recommending that the commission recommend to the city council acknowledgement of the environmental determination and approval of the tentative map design permit and the residential uh, demo authorization. <clears throat> I did get, I'm pretty sure I got 17 letters in opposition. I could be off by one or two. Say again, 17, what was the last I think one? 17 letters in opposition of the project, primarily based on the design um, and the massing. Um, no other uh, comments from the public other than all the letters, and I'm, I'm assuming that you could Got them all. So that concludes the presentation. Okay. At this time, I'd like to invite the applicant to address the commission. Welcome. Good evening, Chairperson, uh, um, Commissioners. <clears throat> I'm Derek Van Alstein. Uh, I represent Derek Van Alstein Residential Design, and I'm here with Mr. Hensley, who is the <coughs> staff architect in my office. Could you make sure that you're leaning into the mic, sir? Is that better? I believe so. Um, I think I'll reserve uh, at least some of my comments to responding to public comments. Um, we've been through, this has been a long process for us. Um, it's been, uh, after we had the initial meeting with the public, uh, we went through a major revision uh, reduce the size of the building, um, move the parking to the rear. We, we, um, so that, we've been through a number of major revisions, um, which is why some of these pieces aren't exactly accurate, um, and I apologize for that. But um, 
each one of these representations is, uh, represents uh, quite a bit of work. <clears throat> we're, we're happy to work with the neighborhood. Um, we actually had a good time at the meeting, <laughs> um, and it was good to meet all of the neighbors. We're a neighbor. We, we're, our office is right up the street. Um, I've been in, in Santa Cruz since 1968, so I, yeah, I feel a, uh, a resonance with, with the neighbors, I, I, and, I, and I understand um, their positions, um, and I understand that Seabright is a, is a, is a tight neighborhood, and the, and the street is not large. It's not, there's not a lot of width in, in, in the street, so the, I understand all those comments. Um, we're trying to res trying to respond in the best way possible, to um, work with the neighborhood and work with with staff. Staff's been terrific, um, but we've been through a number of iterations to get to where we are today. Um, there, there, there are no asks for this project. We designed it to to conform to all the regulations, <laughs> to conform with the general plan, and to, and to conform totally. Uh, with the zoning regulations, and we're still glad to work with with the city and work with neighbors to make us the best project that it can be, uh, and be good neighbors. So, with that, I'd like to re just reserve some time at the end, and I'd be glad to respond to whatever comments arise. Thank you. Are there questions for staff before we go to public uh, comment? <clears throat> You have a question on the uh, replacement housing. So just to clarify, it is two bedroom, rental bedroom units that have to be provided, essentially, right. if it's sold at some point. Right. They would still be on the hook to provide two rental units. And is that gonna be on, that would be within the project? How, how does that work exactly? Yeah, it would be a, it would be a second unit. So while the, while the development's being rented, the inclusionary unit can serve as the replacement housing unit. Mm -hmm. uh, if and when they go to sell the, the condominiums or townhouses, um, we can no longer double dip. So there's a for sale inclusionary unit and then the rental replacement housing unit. So it would go to two units essentially if they sell. And again, their only option is on site. It would be a provided. In yeah, this, there's in this the, the code does allow for off site um, housing. We you know we've done it before um, uh, for a development this small. I don't know that it's it's feasible, but the code would allow something like that. Commissioner Conway. Yeah, I'm just confused. Um, if, I'm sorry. No. Um, so this is this is why I hate these mapped rentals. I just think it should be a rental. Okay. Uh, never mind. That's beside the point. Totally get to do it. But I don't understand this because um, if a project, so it's mapped, but it's serving as a rental project. Once you sell the first unit, you file with the state, you're off and going, then it's a for sale project. Um, you. So are you suggesting that the um, deed restricted uh, inclusionary unit is sold as an affordable unit and that somehow the owner retains one unit and and that serves as a rental right right so now they've they're um, providing the deed restricted for sale unit they paid their their um, fractional fee um, and they retain ownership of one unit and rent it at an affordable rate in yeah. perpetuity supposedly they could in theory sell it to somebody else but it, it cannot be owner occupied it needs to be rented as uh, as an affordable unit and, and also keep in mind this is this is a worst case scenario i mean we're this scenario operates under the assumption that all of those units are occupied by lower moderate income families i mean there could be a scenario where we go through the income verification process um, and it turns out that uh, they aren't lower moderate income Households and then these replacement housings uh, requirements would not apply. So we're just we're just sort of giving you what a worst case would look like. Worst case for the applicant. Didn't you because you didn't get those uh, tenants to go through the uh, 
uh, income verification process, you're defaulting to assume they are lower income? So that, yeah, isn't just that determination to, just to, made? Uh, throw it out there. I mean, we have a sort of a blanket condition that would cover that scenario. So you will go yeah. through income we, verification? You know, and this does need to go to council, and, and we, we would like to get this issue wrapped up before it does go to council so that we're, yeah. we're firm on, on, you know, exactly what we're talking about. Um, but, uh, You're asking us to consider worst case and whether we we, want. we were we were giving you the worst you know the the you know the, the assumption that all the units are occupied and what what that would look like in terms of affordability. Okay, I, I'm sorry I didn't make clear. We'll invite you up after um, you can have a seat and we'll invite you up after the public comment. Thank you. Are there questions for um, staff, Commissioner Singleton, and then Commissioner Nielsen? Yeah, I have a couple questions related to traffic. So in the staff report, it says um, the nine units is going to generate approximately 57 net new daily trips. And I'm assuming that's along Seabright Avenue or just car trips out of the. Yeah, they're all going to come in and out of Seabright. Okay. And do you happen to know what the current daily car count is on Seabright Avenue? No idea. Okay. Chris is here. Um, yeah, the. Public Works Director or, or System Director. Schneider, System Director, Public Works. It's approximately 15,000 vehicles a day. 15,000? Yes. So It's in our city arterial street. Okay. So this is significantly less than 1% increase in daily car traffic. Even during peak hours, I imagine? That's correct. That's a 24-hour period? Yes, 24-hour yeah. period. Okay, thank you. Mr. Nielsen. Um, in terms of the, uh, <clears throat> the, the pedestrian path that goes from, uh, I believe that's Sumner, Sumner to um, Seabright, was that, a, was that requested by the community? Or was that, I mean, in the beginning process? Just curious. No, it was, the, the way the plans were drawn is uh, there was a gate over that. It allowed, um, it was an emergency access gate and it covered the walkway, so there wouldn't have been pedestrian access. <clears throat> Our but condition there, requires but there that is, they provide it. But, there, but that's what's being proposed, is pedestrian access through there? Is it, a, is it a public pedestrian access going through the site? No, it's going to be a private property, and what we're doing is trying to allow public access to the site. That, right, that so was just, When you say public access, you just mean for emer emergency vehicle access? Pedestrians. From the public, there, there will be emergency vehicle access um, if needed, but the, the the condition that we're suggesting is for pedestrian access through the site, and that came from city staff. Um, we looked at that's a pretty big block, um, and we felt there's a number of general plan policies that would support something like that, since it it's a lot that goes through two streets, and there's um, a lot of uh, neighborhood commercial serving uses to yeah. the south. Um, so the, the, the recommendation based on those general plan policies was for that public access. Um, and so it's open, it's, it will, it's open to the public. So anybody can, can cross through there is what, okay. Right. And, um, one of the drawings I saw, it didn't, it, it looked like there was an auto gate that's there that, that will be locked. Uh -huh. Um, but it didn't appear that there was a like a gate for the public to get through and, and that path looked like it was actually stopped at that auto gate. So that's how, how the plans are drawn. How do, I mean, how, how is that access happening then? With they're they're going to have to revise the gate so that it allows pedestrian access right here. Okay. Okay. So we don't want, we don't want it to be a vehicle shortcut, but we do want pedestrians to be able to use it. Okay. It saves about a thousand feet, I think, uh, if you live on Sumner here instead of walking all the way up the block and down. I think I measured that, and it was about a thousand feet. So that could be the difference between jumping in a car and just walking down to the commercial areas. Okay. Um, and then the other question I have is: Was was it required by the city or by by staff to um, to provide this material articulation? And, and change the material um, on the project? Because it doesn't appear that that's really has happened in the drawing. So I'm just curious. It seemed like it was a requirement within, it was a request possibly from the public um, during that initial 
meeting, but then also it looked like it was a requirement from staff, but I haven't seen that on these drawings, so. Neither have I, that's, that's why we added that condition of approval. Okay, and so then the, so then it will be, it's gonna be up to you, <laughs> at what point do you review that? When are you gonna get that information? And when do you expect to be reviewing that? Depends on what happens tonight. If you approve it with that condition, then it would be up to us. Um, I suppose you could continue it and ask to see the uh, changes. We've also done, uh, as, as you recall, on a couple of the larger downtown projects, we've also had planning commission subcommittees to, to look at some of the, the details. So. Okay. Um, I think that's it at the moment, thank you. Other questions before we go to Commissioner Schiffrin? I wanna clarify the commission's action. We are essentially making a recommendation to the council. This will automatically go to the council because there's a tentative map, is that? Yes. My, is my understanding correct? Okay, um, were there any heritage trees on the site? No. There were trees in the back area. I couldn't determine whether they were heritage trees or not, but there seemed to be some trees back there. Yeah, that would, that's a required, um, uh, that's a required as part of the tentative map, so I didn't see any on the tentative map. Any other questions? So we'll now invite the members of the public to address the commission on this. Could you raise your hand if you'd like to address us? So I can get a sense of how many, okay. Based on that, um, we'll let everyone speak for three minutes each, and we invite you to line up on the right side of the room. If everyone would line up, it helps facilitate the, the meeting flow, and sign your name on the, on the uh, sign in, please, and address the commission if, with your name, if you're willing. Um, everyone will have three minutes to speak, and the lights in front of you will go from green and then yellow when you're near the end, and then and then it, it'll be, it'll turn red when you're done and it'll beep. So I will invite you to please stop then. I hate to be rude, but we try to keep things going and balance receiving your input with also keeping the meeting going. We'll ask everyone to be quiet while you are speaking. And then we'll ask you to please be quiet when others are speaking, including even if you agree with folks, don't cheer because if, imagine if you're the dissenting voice amongst a bunch of folks who don't agree with you, you might feel stifled and you won't share your opinion. And we want, I hope you agree, we want all opinions to be heard tonight. So please be silent while others are speaking um, and they'll be silent when you're speaking. You ready, Tess? So we'll open the public hearing. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, um, commissioners. My name is Scott Harriman. Uh, I'm a local resident. I live on Wyndham just around the corner. Um, I wanted to uh, take a few moments and I'll be daring and be the first person to speak. So to start with, I will tell you that I am not against development. I'm a retired city planner and I've seen lots of development throughout my 30 year career. What I'm here to do is suggest some possible design modifications to better integrate with the neighbor. In addition, I'm really quite familiar with uh, the work of, of the Van Alstine Group and they have done some incredibly wonderful projects in our neighborhood. So I'm not, a, I'm not against the development team too because they're local and they do a great job. What I am here to do is to tell you about our neighborhood. Here's an, uh, an aerial of it. It's a predominantly context of smaller building masses, individual building footprints. There's some unique architecture and the characteristics of the community. There are trees of scale throughout the neighborhood. There are larger buildings have room for larger trees. We've also seen some new buildings with increased heights and density. So we're familiar with a, a development occurring in our yard, in our neighborhood. What I'm here to do is I have six suggestions and these are in the order that I believe are of importance. The first one is breaking the building into two smaller pieces or two pieces. I'm not suggesting they lose density. We understand that density is very important these days, but you can break the buildings up without losing density. So with or without density loss, provide additional large scale trees, reduce the building height, improve access to the rear yards for the units, improve the driveway surface material and eliminate planter strips in the driveway. 
this is the uh, the elevation as it currently shows. It's typically it's one long unbroken elevation. Uh, the building spans from the front to the rear with uninterrupted um, uh, building building mass. There are minimal opportunities for trees of scale, and there are uh, two guest parking stalls. This is not a development pattern that, that really transfers well to other sites because if you fill the entirety of your site within the building envelope with building, it doesn't provide much room to do much else with it. So we would say that this is not a, a, a good building pattern to transfer. Here's what we're suggesting for the building mass. I've taken the elevations that they, the applicant has shown and I've broken it up into two pieces. So there are, there are eight. Um, these are the same width buildings, and so we've got a more, this is more consistent with the neighborhood. It adds room in the middle of the building for larger scale trees. It adds more end units, which have greater uh, light, and visit, light and air, and it may provide areas for additional uh, guest parking, as you can see in between there. This is a photo montage that they've provided. They have left out the trees in the front. However, they didn't include the ramping, as, as Mike talked about. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have provided you all of my comments um, on this, and we uh, recommend that any recommendation you make to City Council include those uh, recommendations. Thank you for your time. Thank you. May I just pop it? Welcome. That guy's a tough act to follow. Um, so, sorry, I had a little outburst earlier and I just want to apologize for that. So I am the person on Clinton that the garage you speak of is there. So I, I'm just interested in what the easement is going to be there as far as I've actually talked to the surveyor that did that, that, that did it, the survey, and then he did a survey on my property. And that garage is actually only two feet set back from my property to the the property line where this is going to come to. So I'm just wondering how far back this is going to be. And then the only thing I really want to add, and I'm sure everyone else is going to add, is this parking situation is going to be absurd because there's no room to park in front of the garage. And this is Santa Cruz, and people don't park in their garage. So you're going to have 20 cars out on Sumner. And I know people that live on Sumner and they're really worried about it. And then when you get to Windham, I've lived on Glenview Street, which is right down the road. Windham, if there's two cars coming together, one of them has to pull over just so the other one can pass. And that's gonna be the access point from Sumner. And then Seabright, I know that block as well. There's never any parking right there. So it's, so parking is a real, real worry for this place. So I just wanted to put that out there for you guys. And I'm going to give up the rest of my minute and 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for your benefit and for uh, everyone else, I should have shared. Um, it doesn't. It's not going to feel like a dialogue because we won't have a conversation with you. But um, offer your questions however you would, and then in our discussion, we'll aim to address them. So. Okay. Uh, just one other thing is, as far as I know, so. Uh, I had it, I got a flight that said they were gonna make it 36 feet tall, and as far as I knew with a residential, you can't go that high in Santa Cruz County. I always thought, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a building contractor, and as far as I know, you can only go 29 feet. So, um, that's gonna be, I'm not sure how that works, but, uh, and once again, you know, I'm all for development, and I'm for them developing this, and for you guys developing this. It just seems like it's a real high impact with absolutely no room for open space, zero. So. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Sage and I live on 527 Sumner Street with the uh, rainbow colored chicken coop that you saw on the slide. Um, I'm, I'm pretty devastated by this plan. It feels like Motel 6 is moving right next door to me. Uh, it is a huge block, 36 feet tall. We were told 30 feet tall, and I think there was some assumption that we would know at that public meeting that 30 feet tall didn't actually mean 30 feet tall, and that was upsetting to me because I didn't know three stories at that time. So I just found out this past week, no, we're going to be looking at 36 feet of building because my house isn't on, it doesn't face Sumner Street. It is actually turned to the side, so my living room window, my bedroom 
double doors are all gonna be looking at this building. That's just my personal problem. I am kind of offended by this project. Um, this is in no way meeting the housing plans request for affordable housing. These units are very large. Each bedroom has its own bathroom. There is no way these are gonna be affordable. These are gonna be, my guess is rented for $5,000 a month at least, maybe more. The units that he was showing you the examples of rent for $4,600 a month. They are smaller and, and so you do the math. Okay, two bedroom garage, I mean two car garage for three bedrooms in, a un in units that either very well-to-do college students will be renting, which means they'll have six, seven kids per unit, or Silicon Valley vacationers, right? If it's them, okay, they won't need more parking, but if it's six, seven college students, where are they gonna put their cars? It seems like a stupid thing to care about, but I have to park on Wyndham fairly regularly. We, uh, Sumner Street is completely packed at night. So this is actually a living problem for us. And what he, the other guy said about Wyndham, I come out of Sumner every day and I have to like try to make sure that I can get out. You can't, it's a very narrow street. Okay, I don't even wanna focus on that. I am also pro-development. I think we have a terrible housing problem here. And I was, I've always known that this lot would eventually be developed. It's just the way this is happening is not in keeping with all the outcry in Santa Cruz and all the need that we have. We're, we've, I've lost three good friends, families who've had to leave the area because they can't afford to be here. And these units are, going to be out of most people's reach, okay? Um, I am, there's been, for me, there's been some misinformation. I was told that uh, we would not be shaded. I think my partner's gonna talk about that more. It looks to me like not just December 21st or 30, whatever that date was, the solstice or something, but for many months of the year, my property is gonna be in some deep shade, a good amount of my property. I don't understand that. Uh, disconnect there. Anyway, I would, last thing I wanna say is, there's a lot of things you don't understand if you don't go and see our neighborhood. So I really would ask all of you to drive over and walk around and take a look at what is there and what this is gonna do to us. Thank you for Thank your you. comments. Welcome. Hi, my name is Catherine Norton. I live on James Street, which is just um, across from this development. So I'm opposed to this development at Seabright Avenue because it would detract from the neighborhood feeling of Seabright and would impose upon the numerous small bungalows that currently reside there. I live in a 1,500, sorry, 1,400 square foot house, so this is significantly bigger. The addition of this many units would add to the congestion of Seabright. And as a resident of James Street, I am well aware of the amount of cars that back up onto Seabright on a daily basis. I also commute from San Jose, so I understand at the end of the day, people are very frustrated and they just wanna get home. The addition of a nine unit development would bring exponentially more traffic, not only to Seabright, but to the surrounding streets as well. Oftentimes cars race down my small one block street trying to avoid traffic, making it a dangerous for my, student, my children to play outside. Seabright Avenue is not safe for bicyclists and the sidewalks are not safe for pedestrians. There's limited parking, almost no crosswalks, and the sidewalks are in poor condition. The proposed development would compound parking problems and congestion. To echo some of the other comments, parking for this development is a big concern as people don't typically park in their garages and guest parking is very limited. I understand the need for more housing in Santa Cruz, however, packing in a nine unit development on this property seems careless and unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. My name is Fred Aaron. I live at uh, 527 Sumner with Sage there. We're facing this new development. And uh, during the public uh, meeting we had previously, it was discussed about the shading. Um, we were told that it wasn't gonna shade our property. We went ahead and designed an um, additional dwelling unit. We're, we're gonna have solar panels that are five feet in the setback from that uh, fence. And given the shading uh, that, that it looked like, I couldn't really tell from there, it looks like it would be covering up now the solar panels that we were gonna install uh, on that side. So um, we were told it was 30 feet and I always thought, oh, 30 feet's gonna be okay, where the sun's not gonna bother it, but now we're near it's 36 and we see the shading results. It looks like uh, we're not gonna be able to put in solar panels uh, on our additional dwelling unit. I uh, just also wanted to say uh, about the public uh, meeting we had, there was a lot of, um, of pushback against the pedestrian access 
um, mostly for the same reason that, that everyone's been talking about is that it, we're worried that it's going to lead to more parking on um, people parking their cars in Sumner and just walking into their houses or guests doing that. And uh, just like everybody else here, um, I have to park a block away from my own house and uh, often because we don't have any on-site parking. So um, I'm definitely concerned about that as well. And um, it's uh, just like everyone else has said too, it's, it is a very large, it's just a single, just big building that doesn't fit in with the neighborhood at all. Opposed to it for that reason as well. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Gail Jack, and I'm with the Affordable Housing Now Task Force in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I, I think uh, I hear what the neighbors are saying. I don't live that close to this site, but I think the project is just overwhelmingly large for this neighborhood. But our concern is more about it's not affordable housing, and that's what we need in the city. We've just had a report on our uh, where we are on, in the housing element. We are way, way behind in the number of low and very low income units we have to build by 2023. And we are far above the number of units have, that have been built for market rate, moderate rate housing. So this is just a bad use, I believe, of this property. Uh, you could build much smaller units. You could build a two-story building that maybe wouldn't overwhelm the neighborhood so badly. Uh, I'm not a builder. I can't. I won't even go into that. But I just want to remind the commission about our need for very low and low-income housing in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Hello, I'm Evan Surogi. So I got two mathematical ideas I'd like to uh, share with you all. So first off, one is greater than zero. Today, there are zero affordable units on this property. There's no, I asked Mike Ferry, he said there's no deed restricted affordable units on the property. There will be one deed restricted affordable on the property after the project. Second thing, nine is greater than three. This is six more families or households that will be able to live in our community. This is an opportunity for more neighbors. And, you know, I understand concerns about traffic, solar panels, shade. It's not really shade. I like shade. Um, <clears throat> but, like, wh where's the priority here for having housing for people in a housing crisis? In a housing shortage, you need to put more housing to get out of a housing shortage. This does it. And it's already at like close to the maximum density that's possible. So like, sure, you could build more units if you change the zoning or something. That'd be great. Go ahead. Go ahead and like get a zoning exemption and build 40 units there with like, you know, make like each story like have like one unit. That's cool, but that's not what the zoning allows. So this is a zoning compliant project. It has an affordable unit where there's no that exists today. And you gotta approve it. Like this is, there's like state law that says like if there's a housing project that meets your zoning laws, you gotta approve it. Otherwise you could face penalties for not approving it. So prove it. Thank you for your comment. Please be quiet while others, I guess, um, other people are addressing the commission. Um, most folks were quiet, quiet when everyone else has addressed the commission. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Ruth Miller, and I live at 911 Seabright, which is directly across from the proposed development. Um, so when I look out my front window, that's what I'm going to see. So <laughs> that's part of my investment in it. But I'm also invested in the neighborhood. I'm not going to reiterate the things that I've said. I think it is out of scale for the neighborhood. It doesn't fit in. Yes, you can go down to big condos blocks down, uh, much closer to the beach. I think you have to decide as a commission, is that what you want to see on Seabright? Because are, is that the intent going forward? If you approve this, then what will happen with the next one? Because right now it's pretty much single family homes in that block and in the previous block. Um, there are some apartments that are a little bit larger, but for the most part, they blend in. You were asking about the percent, one percent more trips in terms of um, traffic. It isn't I don't think the trips and traffic as much as it's the parking. 
because I, when I open my car door, if there are, I can't open my car door, <laughs> let's put it that way, um, when I park on the street. And if there's traffic across, if there's parking across the street, neither one of us can open our doors and you can't fit two cars going down Seabright um, in the middle lanes when cars are parked on either side. I have witnessed slowdowns with response for emergency vehicles by both um, looking out my front window, I can see the big fire trucks coming down. And if there's traffic backed up, which there often is, particularly in the popular hours for the beach, um, they can't get through. And so they're slowing down their response time now. Um, the answer isn't to go on to Sumner, but it's certainly not to go on to Seabright. And when I ask about, I've called and I've said, so what's the plan? I don't get a plan for how you can mitigate the parking. And these units, if you look at the design, bottom floor, own bedroom, two on the top floor, it's not going to be a family. There's no little kids that are going to be separated from their moms and be away. Those units are designed to have at least four to six adults living in them. You're not talking about two cars and two car garages. You have to be realistic about what the design is and what the both the need for housing, but it's also the need for parking for the people who live there. Um, and they're going to need that. So it's like, where do those go? They got to go somewhere. And I can tell you, see, right, it's hugely impacted in a really, I think, unsafe way around the parking situations, um, especially with I have experienced it. <laughs> and you don't even have cyclists going down the road. You have them using the sidewalk because they can't. It's too narrow there. So we have a lot of issues around that that haven't been addressed. And I keep hearing all the concerns have been addressed. It's like, uh, no, <laughs> not this one. So, and I don't know who to turn to anymore. It's talking to you, talking to the planner, <laughs> you know, it's like, do you go to public works? No, you go to the city council? Okay. So, you know, it's, I'd love an answer to that, or at least some ideas around that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Jane Mio, and I live since 72 in the Seabright area. Um, I would like to talk about the spirit of the Seabright area. It has been documented that it's unique because of its small neighborhood, its community oriented. And I quite frankly am greatly disturbed to see how slowly the Seabright area is being literally barricaded and choked. Slowly, the house levels are going up. First, it was like, oh, it's just 28 feet. We turned, we opposed that. We turned around to find it's up to 30 feet, 33. And one of the things is that these units that are being built are ghettos. The people that live in these big buildings that are like their own unit, they don't really come out and mix with, our, with the rest of the community, the neighborhood. It's starting to get really segregated and ghetto. And the barricading look is imprisoning us. And you can't allow that. So new development is fine within a concept, but it cannot destroy what historically always has been celebrated as a good neighborhood. So that is my say. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. My name is David Hill, and I live in the 900 block of Seabright. It'll be directly next to the uh, proposed development. And I, I know that 57 trips doesn't sound like a lot, but we have a situation in Seabright where it's nine units here, six units there, four units here, 10 units there. The cumulative effect of all this development is radically changing the, the traffic patterns. If you look at the pictures that were shown to us during the day of the, the number of cars parked. That's a fraction of the number of cars that are parked in the evenings and at night. And, uh, and then to go one last point is they said that they wanted to break up the mass. Well, I'm all for breaking up the mass, but you don't bring up the mass by changing the paint color. You break up the mass by not having as much mass. Thank you.
Thank you for your comments. <clears throat> Welcome. Oh, good evening, uh, Greg Bengson. I um, I did live in the Ross uh, camp. Um, however, I've also lived in a $22,000 a month flat in London. Um, affordable housing, yeah, it's essential. Um, but I can see both sides where the uh, the sense of a neighborhood is essential and trying to force something uh, that doesn't belong just for um, development or for uh, meeting certain abstract uh, points. The main thing is 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 almost something intangible, the feeling of a neighborhood. And that's what's so cool about when you walk through parts of Santa Cruz. And that's probably why I'll probably go back to being back in venture capital and, and not just hanging out with the, with the wild bunch. Um, I used to go to lots of planning commission meetings down in uh, Monterey County, but um, this is my first one here. Uh, I just love the city and um, I'm not gonna live in Ross Camp anymore. I'm gonna start moving back up, but it's because it's a cool place and uh, thank you everybody. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Yes, good evening. You know, I lived in the, the area for three years when I was a poor student, so I'm very familiar with it. It's, it's an, a lovely neighborhood, and it's always been very endearing to me. Um, it's part of the roots of my living in Santa Cruz and staying here. Um, it hasn't been mentioned tonight that this is a 277.5 feet building, um, continuous. Um, it's a massive building. It's over 1.0 far. The um, downtown update plan was allowing only 200 feet until the last rendition when it was deleted because they wanted to put a hotel at the corner of Soquel in front, so that was removed. But otherwise, there was a 200 feet restriction, and here it's 277.5 feet in the neighborhood. Um, when people think of two and a half stories, they think it's two and a half stories. And so people are always surprised when something is three stories. And this whole idea of the, you know, the midline roof, and it's actually higher than that. I always joke everything will be Darwiner judicial roofs in the future for that reason. But um, these are all very deceptive ways of getting around different issues with, with the neighborhood and their understanding of what this project really is. And so ultimately the general plan can allow you pretty much to build anything as long as it's within the number of units and the density. Um, and you can ignore many of the other amenities that are there for the neighborhood. And until there is some kind of design review board, which there even was my understanding in the 70s, um, I just came across it and was kind of surprised to find that there was a design review board with three community members, uh, an architect, landscaper, and then they also added a building contractor for technical expertise. And um, Derek is a very well-known architect. Um, he's built fine homes, but when it comes to infill development, it's a very different type of uh, project. And so he's in a learning curve, basically, and he's trying, and so yes, he's having to go through this iteration because he's having to think through things that he may not have ever thought before. And as far as affordable housing, um, the ones down the street, they're still open for rent. Um, they've been available for a while. They've never been fully rented at $4,600. Um, I figured these will probably be about 5,500 because it's about 900 square feet bigger. We haven't included the HOA fees. If you look at it 30%, it's probably 220,000. With the AOA fee, HOA fees, it would probably be about 236,000. Um, and that would be what would be accommodate for that kind of um, unit. Um, as far as affordable, when you say 80%, it's actually 80 to 120%, so that's what they call moderate. But essentially, it's not really affordable because it's at over $3,000. And for most people, that's not affordable at all. Um, so basically, everybody here has made really great recommendations. I think Allison Russell's recommendations were great. They're in there. I would certainly hope that you would look at that and um, decline this project. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Does anyone else like to address the commission as last chance right now? Okay, um, thank you for um, coming tonight and for sharing your views with us. Um, I'd like to invite the applicant back up to <coughs> address the commission with any rebuttal or responses to public comment or other, <coughs> other things you wanna share with us. We usually limit applicant uh, testimony. For re rebuttal time? Yeah. yeah Okay, it's it's chair's discretion. Okay, um, how about ten minutes? For I'll probably take less than okay. ten minutes. 
Welcome. Um, I hardly know where to start. Uh, I think that if you look at the big picture, um, we need all types of housing, not just low or affordable housing. We need affordable housing for all income brackets. Um, and it may be that we're, uh, you know, we're ahead of the game for high, the higher income brackets. Now I can understand that. There are, and I forget the name of it, but there are enterprise zones uh, that uh, that make allowances and and uh, set aside and have set asides um, for development um, that helps you do those types of units. This this property doesn't happen to be one of those properties that enjoys the, uh, the set asides, and. It's very hard to do uh, low income or low to moderate income units, uh, more of them, without having some gives um, and so, and some asks as it, as you go through the process. Um, the I understand the uh, the comments regarding uh, getting more definition in 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 the buildings. Um, I think we can work towards that. Um, there's not a whole lot of room to work with it, but there's some certainly, and we can certainly change materials and we can change colors and, and maybe we can find places to put more trees. Um, I think that we can we can soften uh, the exterior of the buildings. There is is quite a bit of definition actually in the building now. It doesn't show up uh, in 2D plans, but when you see the building in 3D, there, there are a lot of offsets, and so they'll, we'll, they'll create those offsets will create shadow lines that'll help break up the building some. Yes, it's a very large, a very long building. Um, it is, I think, uh, well articulated as, as much as it can be. Um, maybe we can find some other ways to, to uh, help uh, mitigate those concerns. Um, we made a we made a conscious effort uh, early on in this project to pro not only provide parking but provide all the parking except for the two spaces as covered parking so that we didn't have cars um, out out in the public view shed. Um, that's been successfully done. There's the uh, library. Uh, I think it's called Library Lane, uh, which was a little project. Um, Around the corner from my office, that did just that, and it's uh, it works just fine. It's it's about the same number of units, about eight units. Um, it has two parking spaces uh, for uh, for guests, and there are you never see cars parked there because everybody uses their garage. We provided um, more than the required amount of space so that people had space to put. Um, surfboards and bicycles and the accoutrements of daily life in Santa Cruz. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a place to, to hang your wetsuits. There's a place to, to, you know, store your bikes and your surfboards. This doesn't involve the garage space. Um, the, there was a suggestion made to increase access to the backyards. I think we could work with that. I think we could play with that so that it, that it is more an invite, in, is more inviting. Um, one of the things we did was we provided space for the trash cans because we didn't want trash cans outside. We want this to be a, a real clean and neighborly friendly project. There was uh, there, uh, there there's been quite a bit of discussion about the uh, the pedestrian access through through the property. Um, it's not something that we particularly support. <laughs> um, some of the neighbors do, and some don't. Um, there was quite a bit of sentiment at, at the public meeting uh, with the neighbors uh, regarding having access through and and my feeling from that meeting was that the neighbors were not supporting that even though uh, the the under the regulations that you've cited um, <coughs> they are encouraged um, it might be a good thing to look at not having that cut through so that the people that are on the cul-de-sac cul -de -sac feel like they're still on the cul-de-sac um, or it might be good to open it up and, and have pedestrian access but it's a it's a discussion that we still need to have I think um, I'd encourage you to um, 
to approve this project as it complies with all the regulations and it applies and it complies with the general plan and we were very careful to to, to design it that way so that um, we would minimize the amount of turbulence that we have to go through to get to get approved so um, with that I'll relinquish my time and thank you and if you have any questions I'd be glad to answer I've got a couple questions Pleasure, Nielsen um, <clears throat> Did, uh, just, uh, I have a question, well, I have a couple questions. Um, did you explore breaking the building into two um, masses? Actually, early on, uh, there were more than two <clears throat> divisions in the buildings. Uh, what happened was fire absolute de absolutely demanded uh, that they have 20 feet of clear access all the way through the property. Um, that, that put the kibosh on, on on that space that we had to be able to work the buildings back and forth. Um, that was, a, that was a, a bitter pill to swallow at the time. Um, but we completely revised the, the plans for this project um, based on fire's requirements. Um, and, and, based, and, I'm, and specifically, Scott Harriman's um, uh, presentation showed an, uh, an image of if it actually made it up on the screen or not. Did yes, you um, yes. Um, and he also gave me one of the uh, okay. handouts, so that was really great. Um, do you, I get, my question is, do you find, would that be feasible to do that? I don't think it's feasible. Uh, and the reason is that we, you know, we're, uh, we're really using the rear yard setback, or the, or the we're using the setback off of Sumner uh, for, the, for the guest parking. If we, um, we've already reduced the buildings, the building widths to such an extent that they just encapsulate the garages uh, and the entries on the first floor. Um, we had to go through the, uh, after this last meeting, after the public meeting, we went through and we took a foot out of each, uh, each unit on all three floors. So we basically redesigned the building in order to uh, pull the building further back off of Seabright, um, do the entry on Seabright, and put the parking in the rear, which was in, in uh, response to the public comments. I'm, th what I'm getting to here is that if you push the building apart, you really have to use that for the parking, for the guest parking. Mm -hmm. um, it might be possible, uh, I mean, I'd be happy to look at it, it might be possible to have the parking ahead of, uh, in the middle, uh, the two parking spaces with a, with a tree or, and planting ahead of the parking spaces, there might be room to do that. Okay. It's possible. Um, okay, thank you. And um, uh, in terms of the um, ex the accessibility at the at the front of the lot, in the where the ramps are. Yes. Um, so that's is that that's taking care of your the requirement for accessibility from public right away. Yes. And um, you have two. A there are potential of two access points for that for your entry. I, I would assume that you could you could have access from Sumner if you if, if this public if, if there's a public way that comes in from Sumner. And then, and I guess I, I'm bringing it up just because you're pr there's a lot of space used in the front for this ramp and to get up to that grade. And so I'm curious if you looked at using access from the back from Sumner. Um, I'd, I'd love to do away with the ramp in the front. I, I don't like it. I, you know, they, they uh, when you have to zigzag a, a, a ramp like that, it, it eats up so much territory that, uh, that it tends to be ugly unless you can disguise it in some way. So I'd be happy to look at, at doing it from the back. That may be, that may have to be included in the in this pedestrian access. Right. I mean, you, right. you would you would need to have access through. I mean, from 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 Sumner. Exactly. In order you'd, to make and that you'd work. have to have a clear path of travel, which is what we're doing to the to the front to Seabright. Right. Understood. Um, uh, I get okay. Another question, since you're here, um, I didn't see any sections of the building. 
um, in the in the set in the plans that we have. Um, can you explain what the ceiling height is in, uh, on the upper floor? How that works? Let Mike. I'm Mike yeah. Tinsley. I work in Derek's office. Okay. Um, so. Perfect. So as you look at this elevate at the Seabright elevation, see the uh, at looking at the top floor where it says top of subfloor to top of plates where it says three six, and then it slopes up from there. Um, there are those are typically within either closets or in this in the stairway area, and then where it's over bedrooms, there are dormers um, that would give a full eight eight foot ceiling. Um, So it might be best to look at the long, long elevation where you can see the, the roofs coming down. What's the, um, I, I, okay, go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, so the plate line, the plate line generally uh, is for the main roof is at, th is at three foot six. Um, the, then the, the, uh, Bedrooms and, and the bathrooms are dormered in order to get them to fit under the roof line. Yeah, I understand. I, I, I understand how that works. I'm just curious what the um, what your ceiling. And it would be great if I had a section. I mean, and I feel like sections should be a requirement um, that that the city asked for, along with the site sections um, that we've asked for as well. Um, but um, it, it's really hard to understand what that ceiling, ceiling height is, especially when we're, when we're hearing comment about uh, the height of the building um, and trying to get an understanding for you know, how much height really is in that space. And is, it, is, it, um, is that something that can be addressed and adjusted in some way? Sure, we can, we can look at that and we can look at maybe the on the roof or, or something like that, but generally, where there are dormer, there are dormers at the bedrooms, bedrooms and bathrooms, and then where the roof slopes down to the three six, is over stairways. Right. And my just generally my basically my question is: Are you, are we ending up with ceiling heights in the in the upper floor bedrooms that are exceeding, uh, you know, exceeding kind of a a, a standard height? No, mm -mm, they're it's set at an eight-foot ceiling. Do you have a flat ceiling in there, or is it vaulted? Flat, flat. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think that that's it for my questions at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. So, Commissioner uh, Spellman, would you like to start the general discussion amongst the commission? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to start this like I start most of my design permit uh, responses. Um, unfortunately, the drawing standards that are the city requirement are woefully insufficient to analyze this project. Um, what's missing from the, there's, there's not a site plan that shows buildings either side of this project. I mean, that is, that is incredible that that's even allowed to be presented without that information, quite frankly. Uh, at a minimum, any adjacent parcel that touches this property should have its structures designated on it with heights, et cetera. There should be site sections north, south, east, west, so we can understand the relationship of this building to the surrounding buildings, to the street edge. Uh, those are just the basics. Um, I'm glad you produced a rendering, but it turns out that that building is four foot short, apparently, right? There's a four foot grade difference in that rendering, right? The, build, the front door is four feet higher than the sidewalk, and it's not that way in that rendering, which leads me to question, so what is the height, and what is the context, what is the relationship? Uh, it leads me to question the solar study. What is the basis of performing that study? Can we rely on the accuracy of the information? Um, that's just not okay, in my opinion, that we stand here and, and analyze this with insufficient information. 
Um, that's not meant to be just a direct um, accusation of you. This is a, an ongoing issue that the city needs to address. But this is, this is an important project. It's a big project uh, being um, proposed in a neighborhood. And we don't get the chance to fully analyze the context around it. Um, that being said, I do want to also acknowledge the public correspondence on this project and engagement has been uh, very involved and I think um, very engaging and forthright with what they dislike about the project and coming forward with ideas that could potentially make it more amenable to the neighborhood. So I want to I want to thank everyone for that. It doesn't always go that way and I think everyone's done a great job of trying to contribute uh, constructive criticism to this project. On the face of it, uh, the figure ground drawing on page one, your vicinity map shows, you know, the size of this building in comparison to buildings around it. Not even in the short vicinity, but in the much larger vicinity. This building is substantially larger than anything else. The figure ground of the 276 foot building continuous with no break is just unprecedented anywhere close to this. Um, you know, so I think there's, that's a problem. Um, I don't think articulating facades or changing materials is going to come anywhere close to, to resolving that. I think there's got to be, if not one, two major breaks in this building. I also question the, the 36 foot height um, resolution. I think this project is an evolution of our 30 foot to the midpoint um, requirement. I think we've come up against this issue several times where projects are higher than the 30, people don't understand it. Does it meet the intent of the code? Yes, by manipulating those roof forms and getting an average roof height of 30 feet, it meets the intent of that code. I think it shows us that that code is not doing us any favors at this point, and it needs to be relooked at. Um, other municipalities have, have come up against that same issue. The code and, and people playing by the rules design projects that are substantially different than I think the intent of what that code is saying. Um, you know, so I, I don't want to even get into the minutia of, of the design of this because I think it's uh, not close to a, an approvable design in my opinion. There are a lot of ways to create nine lots or nine units on this property and not have the massing that this project has. Um, you could design nine individual buildings with proper setbacks between those buildings and have nine units. Three stories, about 1,800 square feet per unit. Um, that was the quick math that I did, but that's, that's real. Um, so I, you know, let me find out what else I've got on here. <clears throat> so I, I do appreciate two comments about, you know, we've met the full intent of the code. We're not asking for any permissions here. We've just, we've designed to the code. And I think the design permit and the relationship to the general plan is one where we've fallen a little bit short as well. It's not enough to meet the zoning codes for this building. There are other relationship um, and character issues that have to also be addressed and assume are compatible with, with existing contexts. Um, that doesn't mean we're building single story, single family homes on this property, but we are respecting uh, a character um, in this neighborhood that uh, unfortunately this project doesn't do. Um, there's no articulation of the front facade or back facade that's going to, you know, make this building smaller. It's going to create some more shadow lines and do different things, but it's not going to reduce the massing of this building. I also question uh, the kind of imposition of all of the balconies that face south and the properties, you know, off of Clinton. You've now put 
you know, every single balcony, which um, doesn't show accurately on the site plan. The site plan shows the garage and I guess the bump outs for a bath, the bathrooms, but it doesn't show the outline of the, the balconies, which are at least potentially five feet from that property line. If the property line were, were drawn on, on the drawing we're looking at on the screen now. So we now have, you know, all the residents that are in that building all hanging out where you would want them if that's your, your building facing south and enjoying the sun, but also just imposing on those, those neighbors. I would think there's a way to articulate the, the imposition of that open space on adjoining properties. Um, yeah, I think that's enough at the moment. I'd like to hear what other people are, are hearing. Commissioner Schifrin? Yes, I have a number of comments and uh, agree with a lot of what was uh, a lot was a lot of what was just said. I would like to read a couple of statements from the general plan because I think what was in the staff report provided one perspective, and I think the general plan has other policies as well that that we should be thinking about. In terms of the uh, the guiding principles, one of the guiding principles is neighborhood integrity and housing. We will maintain the identity and vitality of our neighborhoods, actively pursuing affordable housing for a diversity of households and promoting compatible livability and high quality design in new buildings, major additions and redevelopment. Um, policy CD 2.1, protect and enhance the distinctive physical and design characteristics of neighborhoods and districts throughout the city. I think I have two, follow-up concerns about this project really related to that. It seems to me it is so out of scale with what's around it um, that it really does fundamentally change the characteristic of that neighborhood. Um, having gone out there, looked at the site, um, saw that the two unit, the three units are in front of the site, there's a big uh, open area at the back of the site. Um, I don't I don't think it's ne I don't think it's necessary to have this um, uh, this kind of impact on the site. I do want to ask a question to follow up on one of the statements, which I didn't think I don't think is correct, where a speaker said that we have to approve this project because it's uh, within the general plan density. My understanding is the city would have to approve a, a project that is somewhere within that general plan density but not at the highest end necessarily. Am I understanding that correctly in terms of what the state law requires, if it requires anything? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly uh, which bill he's talking about. I mean, there are some that are currently active that speak to building within the density. I don't, I don't know the exact wording. I know there is some pending legislation that might make certain multifamily developments allowable by right. I think that was defeated um, today. But. Uh, it's it, their bills that we're tracking. I guess my concern is that there seems to be a tendency to really over-densify sites. I think this is, that doesn't mean that there can't be additional density on this site. I'm not sure that it really makes sense to feel that it has to, the site has to hold the maximum density, especially when it means losing three existing housing units. And while they may not be restricted to in an affordable way, they're certainly going to be, they're going to be available at a much lower price than the new units are going to be as proposed by this project. So to provide a diversity of housing, I think um, it seems to me a real shame to lose these housing, the, 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 uh, the existing housing that's there. They fit into the neighborhood really well. Um, and that, that whole block really has a certain quality to it that I think it would be a shame to lose by over-densifying the site with this, what, what seems to me to be a very um, massive structure. I, I kind of hate saying all these things in a way because uh, I'm a friend of Derek Van Alstyne. I've known him for years. I really like him. Um, and I appreciate the work that was done. But I think the the basic uh, um, assumption is an assumption I don't think is a necessary one, which is we must have 
as much density as possible. Because we have a housing crisis, nothing else matters except getting as many housing units uh, as we can. If it means destroying the quality of the neighborhood, <coughs> so be it. And I think that this project really represents that attitude. And I think um, it really undermines the integrity of the general plan that understands the need to try to protect the quality of life in the community by having uh, uh, a respect for the dense, for the for the neighborhoods that are there, and I think that it it, it is uh, like my colleague said, possible to redesign uh, a project for this site that would increase the density and not over densify the site, not uh, be detri detrimental to uh, to the neighborhood. So my my recommendation is that we send the the project back for redesign. Uh, within the density range, but at a lower end and at a uh, in, and in a way that preserves the existing housing on the site. Mr. Conway. So, I um, first of all, I also want to thank everybody who came out, and everyone's been really articulate. I also love this neighborhood. Lived on James Street, lived on Bronson, lived on Owen Street. My brother lived on Sumner, pretty much next door. <laughs> um, one of the things I'd like to say, and have spent a lot of time in this neighborhood, is um, the connectivity within the neighborhood is something that is really lacking on, um, on the east side. And I think it was um, a fashionable uh, planning trend to require everyone to be in cars for a long time. And there are certain neighborhoods, and I think especially on the east side, the ones that I know where you just have these long stretches that really, um, I mean, someone said it, it you, people take a car um, when it wouldn't be very hard to um, go over to, from Sumner over to Hank for Pizza Works um, if you could walk you know, on a pedestrian walkway through there. And I think it would be a real enhancement for the neighborhood. So I am very strongly in support of that uh, feature. I also can appreciate how much um, the design makes would make neighbors concerned about spillover parking and, um, and, and that, that makes it seem like it would be worse. Um, I do believe that connectivity in the end can reduce car trips. Um, and, and so I think that's important. I wanted to thank the architect for how hard they've worked to make this building interesting looking. Um, the articulation, the variation in the windows. I'm not an architect, but I'm just looking at it and I see that there's a, there's a real attempt to make it do that. But I agree, it is a big, long building. Um, it, it feels like it imposes um, I wonder about um, kind of, you know, a little, I both agreeing and disagreeing with you, I think, Andy, is um, I, for one, I do think the existing houses are going to go. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's um, going to happen and uh, we should demand that we get the best possible project. I wonder if you considered, um, rather than having such big units, having more smaller units. Um, you could apply for a density bonus. You could get in, in that way, I, I think make a, less of a, just that physical impact of bigness and um, meet some housing goals. It would also allow for, uh, it, it's also a tool for getting some greater deed restricted affordability which a lot of people have said we need to do. In a project of this size, we don't have a lot of tools um, that allow us to do, to do that. Um, this is, these are projects that are, are um, privately built um, and we need to make them pencil. We don't wanna condition a project to the point where it's impossible to build it. Um, and I, I can see that all of the departments the designers, they're, they're, they're trying to um, uh, serve a lot of, a lot of um, rules and coming from a lot of different sources. So um, I 
think we need housing projects that add units and I think the changes in neighborhoods are going to be happening incrementally um, but we need to make them done be, you know be careful this the massing of this building um, really feels hard hard in, um, to, to take um, despite the benefits that that um, have gone along with it um, so I guess I, f I feel like it's um, it's a good project it's going to be a good project um, and it doesn't feel like it's quite there for our lovely neighborhood. Mr. Spellman? Yeah, I, I want to echo some of that too. I also, you know, I know Derek's uh, office and his work, and I know he will do a stellar job uh, with this project as it moves forward. I just think, you know, I'm all for the density. I'm not suggesting that we take units out, but I think the building needs more than just a little work. It needs some substantial work to, to get a massing that's going to be compatible. And that may mean losing a few bedrooms potentially on, on some of the buildings. So then maybe they're not three stories or, you know, I'm, there's a lot of ways to do it, I think, but it's, it's going to take something fairly substantial, I think. Mr. Singleton? Yeah. Um, I, uh, just to preface my comments, I'm definitely more all aligned kind of with Commissioner um, Conway's remarks and, and overarching need, big picture stuff. I, I won't comment on the size of the building more than it's already been said. It's not a small building. It's a big, big structure. I do think it's out of character with the neighborhood. Um, I think we're probably going to see a lot more developments like this given the zoning constraints we have. Um, I 100% agree. I'd like to see a lot more units that are smaller and, and denser. That would definitely be better. Um, and that would perhaps aid in the breaking up of the facade and, and the architectural elements that we've all spoken at length about. Um, I was really dismayed uh, to just hear a lot of assumptions from the audience about who their neighbors might end up being, regardless of what gets built here. Um, making assumptions about small things like habits with the garage and who's going to use them. You know, it's whatever. Saying that they're not going to hang out or engage with the neighbors. I think it's a, kind of a really pessimistic assumption of your fellow people that might live in Santa Cruz and here, uh, how they're going to get around or use the street. I mean, I know so many people who don't use cars or are really trying to get out of the way of, of being dependent on the automobile. And I think, um, you know, it's one thing we, we have the parking requirements and the developers gone through painstaking means to meet all of them. But just the assumption that everyone's going to drive all the time is how we got into this mess <laughs> so, of urban design. So we got to make some concessions somewhere about that moving forward. Um, and again, they're going, they're meeting all the parking requirements. So um, and the other thing, you know, making assumptions that who's going to live there, it's going to be just in the Silicon Valley people or college students. Well, you know, there are 19,000 UCSC students in the city of 65,000 people. That's roughly one third of the people that live in this city. You know, roughly one third of the people in the city commute over the hill into Silicon Valley every single day. So if you add those two together, because they are pretty much exclusive, you have two thirds of the city that are either college students or Silicon Valley tech workers. It's, these aren't like foreign people, they're your neighbors right now, and they have been. Um, actually, our commuter trends, I just heard from the chair of the RTC, or not the chair, the executive director, Guy Preston, this morning in a meeting, are, we have around 29,000 car trips a day that come out of Santa Cruz County that go over the hill into San Jose, San Mateo counties, um, that's actually down from our peak in 2001 and actually 1999 when we had more. So not only have these folks not new, the Silicon Valley tech workers, but they've been here for 30 years. They've been here longer than I've been here in Santa Cruz. Um, so just to, the assumptions that we're making about people, I think, just leave a really sour taste in my mouth, and I had to make a comment about it. Getting on the affordability elements of it, um, you know, it's conforming with the inclusionary ordinance. There's not a whole lot more you can do in terms of the number of units that we're allowing, the densities we're allowing in the general plan. Um, frankly, to get more affordable units, you either have to significantly increase the density, lower the size of the units, um, uh, or provide public subsidy in some way. And, you know, we have a $3.2 million deficit in the, the city right now. I don't think we're being providing a lot of public subsidy for affordable housing which means it's going to develop or to balance the cost to meet that inclusionary ordinance, probably by pricing of the units a little bit higher than they otherwise would be. Um, also, if we were to tell the developer to go back to the drawing board and do something less dense, that's certainly going to make the end product way more expensive. So if you're talking about the general plan elements that are referring to affordability, reducing the density of the overall project is certainly not going to get you more affordable units. 
Um, in general, I just say, yeah, the building's big. I don't necessarily like the look of the building, but in terms of the need for housing, in terms of the restrictions the developer's working with, I can understand how we got here. And ultimately, I'd be willing to support the project and the staff recommendation, um, but I can understand if, if there are other requirements that we wanna make in terms of helping to break up the facade, other things that we can work with the developer to lessen the impact on the community and, and fit more in line with the neighborhood character. So just my comments. Attorney Essen, you were next. Commissioner Greenberg, do you want after that? Um, yeah, I, th I was just gonna speak probably more to, uh, more to the scale and the size and the mass of this. It is, uh, I mean, it's been said, it's a big building. I, I, I think, um, I think if there was a way to break it, you know, as um, Commissioner Spellman suggested, like once or twice, or even, you know, if there's a way to, to get multiple buildings on the site to make it work, I, I think that would be, um, I, I think that would come more into uh, more of the neighborhood context um, that we've been talking about with general plan and get that more in line. Um, the, I think um, also, one of the ways to do that is to provide a, um, a diversity to the housing type or, or to the unit type that's being presented here. These are all the same units. They're, they're all uh, three bedroom units. And um, if there's, you know, looking at, um, looking at reducing down some of those units to two bedroom or one bedroom um, or studio or something like that, I think we can, maybe there's a way to increase density even on the site, but also, but also kind of reduce the, reduce the overall mass and size of the building or buildings that would end up on the site. Um, I would, so I would suggest um, that as a, as a, as a potential um, redesign um, option. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> discussions around density, um, well, first of all, I'll just say I, I do live in this neighborhood. So, um, uh, so, and I, and you know, I, I do walk by this site, um, you know, quite regularly. And um, so I understand, and I do understand the, the traffic impacts that, that do happen. And, um, and also the, um, you know, some of the impacts that have uh, happened with uh, past development and, and ones that have met the zoning code specifically and, um, and you know how they're they, they may meet it, but they don't. That's they, not a that's not a benefit to the to the neighborhood necessarily. And so, um, so I see the so I understand kind of the um, uh, the message coming back uh, from the community about that. And um, and so I, what I was going to say about density is, you know, density. Uh, d density makes sense in appropriate locations, and um, and based on kind of where we are, where we're at with this density, I, I think I think I think it could potentially work if we're if we're able to get this uh, the building uh, size down. Um, but you know, when we talk about you know increasing density, uh, and um, I, I think you know going back to our Past conversations around the corridors. I mean, this is um, that's where that's where we re re really need to be focusing those efforts. So you know, just that's just looking forward to having those discussions um, in the future. Um, I also would like to um, thank the public as well because um, in this for this particular project, we I, what I noticed was that there was a lot of um, public feedback. That included suggestions, and it wasn't just "I hate this project," and you know, this can't happen. You know, just you know, don't don't allow it. Um, there, we we got a lot of um, correspondence um, with a lot of um, with a lot of ideas about how the project could be modified and things to do that, that could change. And I I really do appreciate that because. Um, it's far more, um, uh, or, or just helps um, kind of guide us to, to hear suggestions from the public around how things could be different. It's not just about 
how you don't want it. And um, so I, that, was, that was something that struck me um, with the correspondence on this. So I, I did appreciate that quite a bit. Um, I think that's it for me. Commissioner Greenberg. <clears throat> Thanks, yeah, I really appreciated everyone's comments um, from the audience and my fellow commissioners. <coughs> Um, and um, it does sound like it's there's interestingly kind of interrelated issues um, in terms of the size and massing of the building and you know affordability issues and the diversity of, of types of units and so forth um, one thing I would say so you know it's a question to me I'm, I'm somebody who's very you know pro generally speaking density when done right um, why it needs to be at this kind of maximum level to, to a degree that all of the units are also going to be kind of, you know, um, very high end and very expensive units. Um, and that if there was more of a diversity in the, in the type of um, units, um, that could also affect some of these affordability questions. Um, and you know the, the questions that are raised by the general plan and some of our goals as a city, our goals as a commission is to really encourage that. And I guess I would say my thinking on that is that, you know, and it's been invoked numerous times that we're in a housing crisis. I would say we're not so much in a housing crisis as we're in an affordable housing crisis. There's a lot of unaffordable housing in Santa Cruz that's being built that exists. Um, and that we have a responsibility, I think, <clears throat> to be as intentional as possible in promoting a diversity of housing types and, and, and supporting a diversity of, um, of homeowners and renters entering into that housing. And so if we're kind of encouraging housing that's only gonna be for the upper end, it's going to also not only affect those nine units um, or eight units, um, but uh, have gentrifying effects beyond this development as well, potentially. Um, and so I'm mindful of that. So there's, there's environmental impacts, there's socioeconomic impacts of things that are built at this kind of, this kind of high end. Um, and I think that the notion that simply building more is going to affect, is gonna bring down costs, um, is something that the scholarship is really, is really challenged. And there's even a new study out um, by Michael Storper this past week about the note, who's a urban sociologist, about you know this idea that you simply build more uh, units and that's going to, it's the, the greater supply is gonna bring down the cost has not been proven. And that often if you just build more supply at the highest end, it actually worsens the affordability crisis. So when I say being intentional, I mean not only you know not uh, under, developing affordable units, but not building units that are going to potentially exacerbate the affordability crisis. So um, I guess I would say that I'm, I'm mindful of that in thinking about this relationship of this, the scale of the units and the degree to which those may kind of, um, those might force a certain kind of um, cost per unit as well for those entering into this, into this market. Um, and to say that that relates to questions about the contextual zoning and the, the questions of how this relates to the surrounding neighborhoods, surrounding community, um, I think those are kind of interrelated issues. Um, so insofar as people are concerned about how this is going to uh, be, be, relate, you know, be um, consistent with the, the types of building and community and the concern about segregation and the concern about gated communities and so forth that are being created sort of within the Seabright neighborhood. Um, so uh, I also am um, happy that people have been so kind of pro, you know, proactive in trying to suggest um, new kinds of designs and, and to work with the developer. Um, and I think that there's potential to really, um, in moving forward, to come up with something that's more consistent with these, with these simultaneous goals that we all have. So I'll leave it there, thank you. I have a question for, um, one quick question for the applicant. Um, with regard to the design, um, with the bedrooms being first and third floor, is that, would you expect the families to be drawn to that or? 
living, there was an assertion in public comment that families wouldn't live in a design like that because they want to be separated from the kids. I don't know that you, I, I don't know that you need to look at it that way. Um, the, certainly, we have a you know a large contingent of people in in the market that are working out of their houses, so that lower bedroom could be used by somebody who's working from home, um, <coughs> i.e., less <laughs> vehicle trips. Um, so that's uh, it, it, that's diversity within the unit itself. Um, that provides different options for different types of living. Thank you. I had a question for staff. Um, how will the how would the public know to to use this um, um, pedestrian access? To this, to just kind of get used to it, and then. Yeah, the the way the plans are now, the the uh, locked gate goes across the sidewalk, so that would have to be remodeled, or you know. Um, that plan would be revised so that it wouldn't block the the sidewalk access. And then it says, "Come through here." It says nothing, or what's it? Is it what's that? How would if I'm walking by and you know I'm trying to respect private property, so I won't, don't want to go in your driveway, but I can if it's uh, public access. So how would I know that? And you just people just figure it out. I would imagine, yeah, you just figure it out. I mean, near the the little alleyway by. France 40 library is an example that, mm -hmm. and people figure it out. Well, a lot of people don't figure it out, but it's also not signed. So I guess it could work like that. I also had a question about the public meeting. Was that part of the outreach? Um, was yes. it a requirement? It wasn't just choice for the applicant? No, no, that was our, our requirement. Okay. And then could you bring up the zoning map from your uh, staff presentation? So RL, this is R, this is zoned RL. So the density range is 10 to 20 units. Right, 10.1 to 20. Uh-huh. You can actually go up to, I think it's 30. 27 and a half. Yeah, uh, the studio or one With bedrooms. smaller units. Okay. So how do we reconcile <coughs> that map and all of that RL and the density of this project, the massing of this project, by that by that language could be everywhere where the orange is. Is that true? Well, I'm not sure about the massing, but the density. But why, the the why couldn't the massing be? If, I mean, if similar to this, if the massing is allowed, happens to be that massing, um, if the lot allows it with this density, it could be everywhere in that orange area, right? I'm not sure, I don't understand your question. Well, RL is everywhere. So the, all of that RL could have the same density as this project. Density Depending and massing the aren't size. the same thing. Uh, Sorry, the, right the, yeah, right, the, yeah. Dense, the density though. Right. Not the massing, right. But the massing could be there as well. Nothing, yeah. right. as Nothing it's proposed excluded. here, it could be proposed on every other site that wants to reach the maximum density. The reason I bring it up is because that density range and the character of this neighborhood are totally out of sync. And um, that's just the observation I have that looking at that map, that is a, a really large section of RL that allows us for that 10.1 to 20 or 27.5. So. Um, it's just, a, it's, I think it's a challenge to then to carefully pick where we're going to put any given project, where we're going to slot them in that range. That's my own opinion. And that this one's quite high. Um, maybe not the density, but the, the resulting massing to me. So that was, which has been reflected, which has been um, shared by some other commissioners. Um, I don't have other questions um, for staff other than just because I don't want to repeat other commissioners. Is Commissioner Schifrin and then Commissioner Conway are you going to suggest a path forward? I have a. I just have another comment to make. I'm not, you know, um, really. It that doesn't really change where it goes. But um, as we've been referring to, I think it is really important not to confuse density and massing. Um, 
I understand why these units came in looking like they did. This is an ex is just expensive to build, and um, in in our community in our whole area, and so to design a product that maximizes um, the possibility that you'll be able to get the financing it takes to build it. Uh, that that drives a lot of it, and I think that's a, a lot of our frustration. I mean, I recognize that um, that's got to be part of the driver here, but it's also I think what we're hearing is that nine units you could get thirteen units if you used a density bonus, and it could be a much smaller building. Um, I know that then you're right up against. Well, are you going to be able to get it financed? Are you going to be able to? Um, you know, render the, the um, what it takes. And I know that that's the balancing point and that's what's gonna make it really tricky to make this a project that works. We need this project. Um, my preference would be to see a 13 unit project of smaller units, uh, much smaller units if, if, if possible. Um, I know that there's a there's a lot of things that we're we're juggling in there as well. It's just not a simple path, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that of all of the things that are driving here, one of them is just how much it's going to cost to build. Mr. Schiffrin? Yes, a couple of things. One, I think that there've been many people in the neighborhood would that would be very happy if the density um, determinations of RL was changed. I think there have been re requests to the city council to reconsider that and reduce the density because of how the fear of how the neighborhood's gonna change around it. On the other hand, I think one of the ways that increasing the density certainly on this parcel makes sense is that it's a pretty large parcel. And you know it's possible to add density to it um, and I think um, make it work. I think what Commissioner Conway's saying is it's a, balancing act. How do you protect the, you know, the integrity, the quality of the neighborhood, provide additional housing uh, units that, uh, that provide some diversity and make it all work economically? It, it is a challenge. But that's, I think, our, as I see my responsibility on the commission, it's relating to trying to find a balance between those. And I think it's um, the point about um, the only, you know, to get affordability, we need more units because that's how we can get the the uh, restricted unit. There's truth to that, but on the other hand, as Commissioner Greenberg was saying, what are we doing in terms of the impact of the market rate units on the neighborhood, on gentrification, um, and to be able to have a mix of units? I really thought that Commissioner Nielsen's comment about they're all the same size. It's all going to be of one, uh, going to appeal to one segment of the market. Is a was a really uh, insightful for me way of seeing that having some kind of diversity, some mixture of size and types, and having them work on the site is maybe a challenge. But I think it's an important goal for us to try to support because it is desirable to, while we're increasing density, to also preserve what's valuable in terms of the quality of life in our neighborhoods. So I, I, what, what I'm hearing, and I'll try a motion, and it can be ripped to shreds as it usually is, uh, that we uh, send this project back for redesign to reduce the massing, to stay within the density range, uh, if possible, to provide a uh, diversity of housing types uh, within that range um, and return to us when it's um, ready to go, when there's a, a project that, is that, that we're ready to review. A second? I'll second that. And before we discuss it, is staff... Um, Mike, does that give you enough direction to work with the applicant? I would, uh, unless you got a test, I'd, I'd like you to repeat it. Did you get it? I was distracted for a second. Continue for... Commissioner Schiffrin, could you Continue try that for again? redesign uh, with, to reduce the massing, to uh, provide, stay within the density range, provide a variety of housing types. 
So you're saying stay within the density range yeah. or maintain the nine unit density that they've got? No, I was saying stay within the range the density. of the general plan. I would like to add the, to, if I thought it would pass, to try to see if there was some way to retain the existing housing, because I think that's going to be the most affordable housing in the project. But I have a feeling I would uh, certainly not have that pass. So I'm not making that. Uh, I hope that the applicant will consider it, but because I think really in terms of range of costs, having existing housing that's out there is going to be much less expensive than um, what any new market rate how what any new market rate unit's going to cost. And so having that density range is desirable. And having been out there, I think the site allows um, for you know, using the existing, uh, providing some uh, uh, development around the existing units that could let them work. But I'm not putting that in the motion okay. because. So you have a, a, a motion okay. and do you retain? I, I, just one second. Do you point of order, actually, I, as a question about the motion, um, uh, which is just I didn't understand. You said you're, you're, uh, you're proposing that we continue the public hearing rather than just deny the project. I just was curious no, about I'm the. Not, I'm uh, not, uh, I, the motion is not to deny the project, but to continue the project for redesign so that it's, I, you know, I'm the one the commission, uh -huh. uh, I haven't been here for a long time. I know at the county, when I listen to the county commission, you know, continuing for redesign is not revolutionary. Uh, so I would imagine that the commission has done that before. And um, given the concerns that okay. most of the commission okay. does that made, Does that answer your question, Commissioner Conway? Um, it, I was, it is a, it is a di unusual action. Um, and so I just was, I, that's, that's what I was asking about is All that right. I understand that, um, w that we're not recommending this, what was proposed. So we're not recommending the staff recommendation, nor are we recommending that we tweak the staff recommendation. And I think in the past, in my experience, when we've, when, um, we've asked a project just to, when we've just said, nope, um, you know, come back at it in another time. It, it didn't have to have a string or a word like continuance, but I'm not meaning to cut that too finely. This, this Whatever is, you think. This is clear to me. It is clear. I understand okay. the, the clear to re or the continue to redesign. Okay. Does that resolve your yep. question? And then with the motion uh, refined or reaffirmed, do you, you, you still second it? Uh, yes. Okay. So any discussion? Motion? No, I, I, I don't need an amendment. I, I, okay. I'd have a little discussion, but. Let me just Mr. say one thing. Conway, do you, wait, wait, Commissioner Conway, you want to go if, with, first with discussion then and then Commissioner Schiffer? And, and I also need a little clarification because we had, a, we, we, we had a, a little bit of piling on. So I think I know what you mean. I want it to be clear. Um, uh, one of the points of within the density range allowed in the general plan um, and one of the goals of the general plan is to be towards the top of the density because we have so little developable land. And I wanted to make sure that it do wouldn't preclude consideration of um, applying the density bonus. Um, I, that's not direction or anything. It's just, I just wanna make sure that the motion doesn't preclude that because I think that might be a tool that could help meet some balances of a variety of housing types and make it pencil. Potentially. Mr. Schifrin? That's consistent with what plan. my, uh, what the motion says. And, and the reason why, I, rather than just continue it for redesign, is I know that the, you know, the applicant would like some guidance. And if the commission agrees that with the sort of conditions of the motion, then that provides some guidance. I'm open to other suggestions. I'm just, I wanted to get a motion on the floor that uh, reflected what I was hearing the, uh, regarding the concerns of other commissioners. If I didn't do a good job or if there are other concerns that uh, should be added, I think it is useful um, rather than just say, go back and try to do a better job to give some direction as to what might make sense for the commission. And that's what the motion tries yeah. to do. Other discussion? Mr. Nielsen. I, I, well, th this is actually, um, I, I have, I know these conditions are not gonna 
since we're not proving this, that the conditions are, are, you know, don't really matter right now. But there was just some house cleaning things that I just want to point to your attention so that, that you can take care of it next time so that it gets taken okay. care of. Um, for uh, condition 48, um, it, it says except as provided in condition number 48 above, but that is condition number 48 that, oh. so <laughs> that's something you may want to look at. Yeah. Um, condition 55, turf is not permitted in new non-residential landscape projects, um, but this is a residential project. So I'm not sure why that condition is there. Um, you could look at condition 56 as well, and there's a typo in there, so you could you could find that one. Um, and then 67 um, that that says handicap access shall be provided in accordance with California Building Code. I would suggest um, just that stating accessibility shall be provided in accordance with uh, California Building Code, um, rather than having the word handicap in there. That was just my suggestion. Accessibility. Um, and that, that was it. Mike, are you getting uh, useful direction? Would you like? Um, no, no, this, the conversation's been good. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good outcome. Yeah, okay. Yeah, one other thing I just wanted to mention while you were deliberating was looking up um, some of the laws in reference to what the city's obligated to approve. Um, and, the, and the reference may have been to the Housing Accountability Act, that's um, AB 3194, which requires, you know, if a project meets objective standards and the city's um, obligated to approve it. When we bring this back, we'll take a closer look at this project in relation to that Senate bill and, and provide you an analysis with that as well. Good idea. Thank you. Any other discussion? So, all in favor of the motion? Could, could we just hear the motion? I pretty much have it. I'll have a better I'd, one. I play I'd, back I'd like, like you to, to uh, share it because if yeah. it's if it's not right, then commissioner to, mm -hmm. to uh, continue the project for redesign uh, that would include reducing the massing, staying within the uh, density range, and um, providing for diversity of the building slash units on the project site. And there was a reference to density bonus being able to be considered. Um, it was, it was, it was just a, as part of the discussion. I just said that was yeah. consistent with the yeah. motion. Yeah. Um, I wanted to clarify that it was, and I think we agreed that it is. Yeah, I'm happy to add it as a friendly amendment if that's acceptable yeah. to mm -hmm. second that. For, first, all, first of all, was that reading consistent with your motion? Yes. Okay. And are you adding a friendly amendment? Yes. Uh, uh, sure. I mean, I don't, I don't need it. I don't. Um, think that it necessarily will make it affordable, but I didn't want it to be precluded, and I think we're all on the same page. Yeah. Given the way that the mm -hmm. state law is written about density bonuses, it doesn't need saying, exactly. but if, if <laughs> That's my, my point. colleague would like it said, I'm happy to include it in the motion. Are you including it? Yes. Okay. Oh, Are you? Uh, yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Nielsen. I just have one, uh, one more thing um, for Mike. Um, what, what's it going to take? I mean, just uh, in line with um, Commissioner Spellman's comments earlier about um, requirements for like uh, drawing requirements, graphic requirements, um, what does it take or what needs to happen in order for that to get as part of what the application process is? Like, is there is there some sort of formal process that has to be gone through to, to get those requirements you know, uh, in writing and to yeah. the applicants? We, we have um, most of, of, well, some of what uh, Commissioner Spellman is asking for on our application form. Uh, we've been learning in the last uh, year or so to play harder ball with our applicants. Um, so the, I, I think where we've been more proactive is with the larger developments, like the one you just heard um, downtown. Um, and getting those yeah, section sure. drawings, um, you know, but we can, it's, it's an item on our checklist and it's, it's really at the planner's discretion. And, and I, you know, I think, you know, with this experience of a, you know, sort of a smaller project relative to those downtown projects that we can and will ask for them moving forward. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's just super helpful. I mean, and to, yeah. to analyze a project and to, um, to understand the, the potential impact it's going to have 
um, in the surrounding area. It, it's mm -hmm. uh, it's critical to, to have that information. Yeah, Commissioner Spillman did, um, he mentioned some stuff that I'd never seen before. The site plan that had the neighboring houses that called out that the height of those houses and the, and the use of those houses. Um, Certainly the figure ground, you know, footprint of the structures. Yeah, no, I've seen the footprint. Can, can I make a uh, sort of point of procedure? Shouldn't we vote on the motion on the floor? And then <laughs> it may make sense to have another motion having to do with, you know, sort of application requirements. Well, I'm not going to do that tonight. We're going to we're going to move on once. So well, I'm, I'm allowing Somebody can always make a motion. Not on a not agendized um, matter. So um, that's why I'm allowing back. the allowing the discussion to see if it's useful for this this project as it comes back. Is that your comments being? Yeah, there have been certain things added recently. I think maybe we should set up something where we could just check in with staff and see if they, we could add a few more. It seems reasonable. OK. And see yep. if that can happen. Yep. So all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. So the motion passes 6-1 with Commissioner Singleton uh, voting against. And um, I also want to uh, say again, um, share my thank you to all the members of the public who attended the community meeting and attended tonight and shared your comments and shaped them in a constructive way to guide a better project for the community. And for benefit of the neighbors, since this is not continued to a date certain, we will provide additional noticing um, once the project's ready for hearing again. Thank you all for coming. We do have more work on our agenda, so if you're going to chat, please um, do so outside so we can continue our work. And our next agenda item is agenda item agenda number six, 601 Branson 40 Drive, and we have a, a staff presentation. Ms. Clara Stanger is the project planner. She'll be given the staff presentation this evening. Thank you. You guys ready? Okay. Okay, this is a little bit of a smaller project. This is for a single family home at 601 Brand Safori Drive. Um, it requires a lot line adjustment, design permit, slope variance, and a watercourse development permit. Okay, so this project consists of four vacant lots on the west side of Branson 40 Drive, just south of its intersection with Glen Canyon Road. Um, to the east, we have De La Viega Park. Uh, the area is zoned R17, which is single family zoning, typically with a 7,000 square foot lot size. Um, the lots um, to the west is a Carbonara neighborhood that's also R17 zoning. Um, adjacent properties to the north and the south of this property, interestingly, are in the unincorporated county area. So it's a little bit weird with our jurisdictional boundaries. So the site is accessed off of a shared driveway that is to the west of and a little bit down slope from Branson 40 Drive. The site itself slopes from the east down to the west. Um, towards Branson 40 Creek. Um, the channel of Branson 40 Creek is actually on the adjacent properties to the west. So here's the site plan. Um, the site plan is focused on the two southern lots of the four lots that are going to be combined. Um, so those two lots down there with the 552 and the one right below it. That's what we see right here. Um, the reason for that is that these two lots actually have the least steep of slope and therefore is the, is the buildable area north of that the slope gets too steep. Um, the proposal is to build a 3,264 square foot, two-story, three-bedroom house. The house exceeds all the setbacks required for the R17 zone district. Um, in fact, it's uh, 47 feet. Um, on the side yard setback to the south, where the uh, minimum setback is seven feet, so there's plenty of space um, between the proposed house and a small um, house on the neighboring property to the south. Um, it's about 275 feet from the side property line to the north. 
um, 40, I'm sorry, 55 to the rear and 24 feet from the front. Um, in, in addition to the house, the project is also proposing some upgrades to an existing drainage pipe that actually drains uh, rainwater runoff from Brant Safordi Drive onto the property. So they're gonna extend that drainage downslope and um, below the house. Okay. Um, the proposal also includes a septic system, which will be located southeast. Um, that's the, the green area there, um, southeast of the house at the top of the slope um, and just below the shared driveway. This is one of the few properties in the city that the Public Works Department would support to have a septic system. The reason is because it's over 200 feet from the closest city sewer connection. Um, Brant Forty Drive is actually maintained by the county and they don't have a sewer line on that street. Um, the Santa Cruz County Environmental Health Department has approved the septic system with a condition that the lots are first combined. Um, our municipal code section 6.20.010 section two requires that the septic system obtain approval from city council. So a condition of approval requires that this septic system be approved by city council prior to issuance of a building permit for the house. And again, the public works department has reviewed and is supported of that um, system. Okay, so um, like I said earlier, Ransom Forty Creek is just to the west of the site. Um, the top of the bank of Ransom Forty Creek is shown approximately by that brown line. Um, and that is an important line because that marks the jurisdiction boundary of the Regional Water Quality Control Board and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, the Regional Water Quality Control Board has confirmed that they um, do not require a permit. Um, and this is specifically for the work below the top of bank, which is um, the um, basically that drainage outfall, um, like dissipation area that they're gonna build below the top of bank there. Um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife is requiring a stream bed alteration agreement um, and a draft agreement has been um, written up that will be finalized um, upon approval of this project and the CEQA determination. Um, work that requires a permit from another permitting agency that has a similar or more rigorous, rigorous sorry, level of environmental review um, as our city's watercourse development permit is actually exempt from requiring a watercourse development permit. So the work below the top of bank um, does not require a watercourse development permit from us. However, some other parts of the project will require that permit. Um, France of Forty Creek is considered a type A creek in the citywide creeks and wetlands management plan. Um, type A basically means that it's um, a larger creek with um, kind of a more um, intact riparian area. Um, so there's a 40 foot riparian setback and that's shown um, by the blue line. A 70 foot development setback is shown in red and then the 95 foot management setback is shown in green. Um, as you can see the western edge of the house along with two cantilever balconies are located within the management setback of the creek. And that is allowed with approval of a watercourse development permit for a type A creek. Um, the way the proposed house is built, as you'll see in the next few slides, it's built up on piers and really doesn't have any extra paving around the house. Um, and the um, plan is also to retain the existing uh, natural landscaping on the site. In those ways, the proposal is compatible with the goals of the citywide creeks and wetlands management plan and the findings for the watercourse development permit. Um, some additional conditions of approval um, will help to ensure that the project is compatible with that plan and with the findings for the watercourse development permit. Um, these conditions include implementing stormwater BMPs during the um, building permit, um, replanting areas that are disturbed um, during site preparation and construction with native ground cover species um, and um, 
having any exterior lighting um, that's within the management setback um, to be cast downward and away from the creek. Um, also, because of the property's proximity to Brant Supporty Creek, um, part of the site is mapped as potentially having sensitive riparian habitat under General Plan 2030. Um, so a biotic report was completed for the project by Biotic Resources Group and Dana Bland and Associates. The report found that the entire um, project area where there's, where there's going to be work is actually outside of the riparian habitat. Um, but it also found that there is some redwood forest habitat on the site. Um, the report recommended um, to have native and non-invasive landscaping species, um, which the project isn't planning any new landscaping, but that, that is going to be required for any revegetation um, for uh, from the site disturbance during um, construction. Um, and then the report also recommended um, erosion co control measures for the drainage work to be completed within the creek setbacks. Uh, these recommendations are both included as conditions of approval. Um, and then finally, um, we do have uh, the planning department's new-ish preferred safe building design standard, um, which has glazing and lighting standards to help prevent um, building related bird mortality near natural areas. Um, so a condition of approval requires the glazing or lighting on the east elevation of the house facing Grand Supporty Creek um, to be designed to meet this standard. Okay, there are also um, a number of trees on the site. It's a wooded site. Um, eight of the trees in the project area are considered heritage trees. Um, and this was determined by the arborist report prepared for the project. The report recommended removal of three trees, which I've circled in red. Um, tree number three is a 15.9 inch diameter bay tree that is within the building envelope and will need to be removed for that reason. Tree number 27 is a 26 inch bay tree that is dead. Um, and then tree number 10 is a two trunk um, bay tree, uh, one trunk is 24.8 inches and the other is 21 inches. That tree has significant decay and then is at risk of failure. So uh, the recommendation is to remove that tree. All other heritage trees will be protected. Um, the city urban forester has reviewed the arborist report and agrees with the recommendations for removal and for protection of the other trees um, and is requiring um, payment of tree replacement in lieu fees for two of the three trees to be removed. Um, she's not requiring payment of the fee for the dead tree because it's already dead. Um, the biotic report for the project also recommended, um, had some tree related recommendations. Um, one of the recommendations um, was for the timing of tree removal during the year and limbing I'm sorry, tree removal or limbing of the tree um, during certain parts of the year to avoid bird nesting season, um, as well as completing pre-removal bird surveys in order to comply with federal and state um, requirements for migratory birds or raptors. Um, the, re the biotic report also recommended removal of heritage trees in accordance with the heritage tree ordinance, which um, we do anyways. Um, but these recommendations are included as conditions of approval. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Okay, so moving on to slope. Um, this might be the most an exciting part of the site here. Um, as previously mentioned, the project is, the site is steeply sloped. Um, the screen shows a slope density map. So the white areas are where the slope is less than 30%. The solid gray is where the slope is between 30 and 50 percent, <coughs> and then the more kind of hatched gray area is where the slope actually exceeds 50 percent. So you can see the outline of the house on this plan, as well as the, um, the little circles, which are the foundation piers. Most um, it's located mostly over the solid gray area with slopes between 30 and 50 percent. Um, but the westernmost part of the house is over an area that's less than 30%, while the eastern part of the house is partially over areas 
um, that exceed 50% slope. So the slope regulations in the zoning ordinance um, prohibit construction on slopes that exceed 50%. However, the ordinance also exempts minor sculpted landforms um, from slope ordinance requirements. In this case, the geotechnical engineer um, that has been working with the applicant has determined that the, the area of slope here that exceeds 50% is actually caused by the, um, by the drainage pipe from Branch to Forty Creek that has caused some additional erosion of the topsoil, basically. Um, and so what they determine is that that part of the slope that exceeds 50% does so because of this kind of man-made thing. Um, if it wasn't there, then the whole slope would be less than 50%. Um, so in that case, um, because this is considered like a man-made excessive slope, it's not, um, it's exempt from the slope ordinance restriction um, pertaining to 50% slopes. Um, I'd also like to note that the project is rerouting that drainage down slope um, and below the house, so it will no longer exacerbate um, the erosion of that area. So a slope variance is required for construction on a slope greater than 30%. In order to qualify for a slope variance, there must be a hardship peculiar to the property, um, and the slope variance should be needed in order for the property to exercise normal property rights. In this case, because of the locations of significant trees on the property, um, including, we got a really big redwood tree right down here. Um, so we have that. Um, also because the um, east side of the property is very steeply sloped, um, that's right next to the uh, <coughs> shared driveway and because much of the sloped area under 30% is actually within the development setback of Branch of Forty Creek and cannot be developed, it's not really possible to build the house unless it is on a slope that exceeds 30%. Um, lots in the R17 zone district are developed with single family homes, it's single family um, zoning. Um, so in this case, construction of the house on this site would not be a privilege above what would be allowed on other lots in the same zone district. Um, the proposed project has been evaluated by a geotechnical engineer um, with Pacific Crest Engineering. Um, their evaluation found that um, the slope on the site consists of several feet of silty sand over schist bedrock. Um, and so they recommended basically that the foundation can consist of piers drilled into the bedrock. Um, they also provided recommendations for site preparation, drainage, and um, erosion control. Um, the house is designed to have a pure foundation, as you'll see in the next few slides, um, and all the recommendations of the geotechnical report are included as conditions of approval. Um, the septic system plan, um, which we saw earlier, has also been um, reviewed and stamped by a geologist, ensuring that it has been designed with consideration of the slope on the site. Okay, so we'll have a quick look at the design. This is the view from the shared driveway that runs parallel and a little bit downslope of Brant Supporty Drive. Um, the garage appears to be a one-story structure from this view, and then the rest of the house kind of drops down the hill, so um, you have an unobstructed view of the forested area. Here's a drawing of the south elevation. Um, so this is the side view of the house. Um, the house is going to have Corton steel panel siding, aluminum windows, um, and steel and cable balcony railings. Um, so it's a pretty consistent architectural theme um, around the house. Uh, the house design meets slope modification permit findings um, since it steps the house down in three segments, um, thus following the natural slope landform on the site. Um, by using pier foundations, it minimizes the modification of the slope, so it's not cutting into the slope, basically. Um, and then, finally, the rooftop decks and the cantilever decks 
provide um, a significant amount of usable open space for the residents that the site otherwise no, would not be able to provide due to the steep slope. So here's our rendering of the west elevation. Um, this is basically the back of the house, so it's not really something the public would view, but um, you can see again how the house steps down um, and that the same design theme is continued around the house. Then there's the view from the north side of the house. Um, so overall, the proposed house meets all development standards for a substandard lot in the R17 zone district, um, including for lot coverage, uh, the size of the second story, setbacks, uh, number of parking spaces, and building height. Uh, because uh, there is a slight discrepancy in the noted building height of, of the top segment on the plans, um, I have included a precautionary condition of approval to make sure the building permit plans show that height of the top story, or I'm sorry, the top section there is no more than 30 feet um, to make sure it meets that R17 zone district standard. So in conclusion, the project meets all of the zoning ordinance site standards and all findings for the lot line adjustment, design permit, slope variance, and watercourse development permit. Uh, the project is exempt from CEQA pursuant to public resources code section 21083.3 and CEQA guidelines section 15183. These um, code sections exempt projects from requiring a CEQA <laughs> review um, that would repeat an analysis from a certified general plan EIR and where the project is consistent with the general plan and local zoning regulations. Um, a CEQA exemption checklist has been developed to confirm this finding. Staff therefore recommends approval of the project um, as well as acknowledgement of the environmental determination. This concludes my presentation. Um, I would like to note that I have not received any comments from the public. Um, but I am available to answer any questions. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite the. Can I ask some questions, please? I'm going to invite the applicant up and then oh, I'm sorry. we'll do some staff questions from commissioners. Welcome. We usually limit uh, applicant applications to 20 minutes. Okay. Presentations. Or that um, yeah, I, my name is Courtney Hughes. I'm with William Fisher Architecture, I'm a senior designer there. Um, I designed this house and been working closely with the client um, along with Clara to kind of address all of the concerns. Um, it was a really challenging site to design on. As you can see, there are a lot of restrictions with setbacks, existing trees, and really steep slopes. So we also worked really closely with Pacific Crest Engineering, um, the geotechnical engineers, Pacific Crest, and then also um, Ifland civic, Civil Engineers. Um, and we've actually, although we're not at the stage yet until we have design approval to begin getting into the details with structural engineer, we've been consulting with the structural engineer that the client will be working with closely to make sure that um, any concerns about the steepness of the slope um, and the soils on the site and the drainage and everything are all kind of well coordinated and thought through. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions for me, I would love to answer them. Okay, thank you. We'll um, call you back up if we okay. if we do. Thank you very much. So any questions for staff before we go to public comment, Commissioner Schifrin? I have a number of questions. Um, as I remember the staff report, the current four lots are substandard, and the one lot is substandard in terms of developable area. Is that my understanding correct? That's correct. Uh, the four the four lots when combined are still substandard, although it is less nonconforming than when they started out. Does the general plan and zoning ordinance allow the creation of substandard lots? I would assume that one of the purposes of the general plan is not to allow the creation of substandard lots. Uh, my understanding is when, when you're, if you're going to subdivide a parcel, you need to create substandard lots. If you're doing a lot line adjustment and you're starting out with a non-conforming situation, if you're, if you're not making that any worse, and in this case, it's making it closer to 
a conforming situation, then that's something that we would encourage. So you're saying that the general, that the zoning ordinance does allow for the creation of a new subdivision? Subdivision ordinance discourages creation of substandard lots through subdivision. This is not a subdivision, this is a boundary line adjustment. And there's, there's, our hands are really tied with respect to what we can and cannot regulate with boundary line adjustments. Um, and, um, and as Clara said, I, I mean, we're, we wouldn't otherwise recommend consolidations of lots in a residential zone, except for the fact that it is making a situation um, less non-conforming. I'm just asking whether it's consistent with the code and whether the code allows for a lot line adjustment when the lot line adjustment leads to the creation of a substandard lot. I, I think the code is silent with respect to that. It's, it's very clear with respect to creation of lots through subdivision, but that's not what this is. Well, it's a creation of a lot through a lot line adjustment. Yeah, it's consolidation of lots. Um, was a tree permit uh, uh, acquired for, I went out to the site, so there is a large tree that had like six or seven trunks that had been cut down right in the middle of the site. Was a, did the city issue a, I can't believe that wasn't a heritage tree. Did, did the city issue a, a tree permit for the cutting down of that tree? Okay, I'll yeah. Mr. Cyprian, would you like to invite the applicant back up to answer that? Yeah. Um. Um, it's my understanding, the clients explained to me, that some of the trees um, that the arborist had actually found were going to fail have fallen down, or there have been, um, some of the trees have failed, and I don't believe that any permits were ever pulled to remove any trees. He's cleared trees that fell of natural causes on the site. Well, it sure looked like they were shaved off, right? natural falling to me. I, I mean, I, I wasn't there, but my understanding is that it could have been that parts of the limbs fell down and he Okay, so there up. was no tree removal permit that was... Not that I'm aware of. Um, why didn't, uh, since there's no CEQA documents here except for the initial study that supposedly as an exemption, which usually doesn't have an initial study. Why didn't the um, staff uh, report, or why wasn't the biotic report included so that the commission could review the biotic report? There's no, the only information is in the staff report itself. Seek a document to really, Doesn't include the draft agreement with uh, Fish and Wildlife isn't included. So I'm just wondering why those um, supportive documents weren't uh, provided to the commission as part of the. This is, I mean, I don't know if other commissioners have been out there. This isn't a slope, it's a cliff. I mean, if I fell off the driveway, that'd be the end of me. I wouldn't slide down a slope. So. The slope regulations, to say that the slope regulations can give exceptions makes me wonder what couldn't they give exceptions to? I, it's hard to believe there'd be a site in the city that they couldn't figure out a way. And, it, and I understand the staff uh, presentation that the, the, the building on the slope above 50% was man-made sure looked like it was all part of a hole that went on for quite a while and uh, down, down, down the hill. But I guess I'll wait till it comes back to, you know, talk about my sequel concerns because my feeling is that the approach that staff has used uh, to justify not providing a CEQA document essentially sets a precedent that I don't see how we'd ever need a CEQA document for any development in the city of Santa Cruz. The combination of um, the general plan covering everything and then what isn't covered is covered by uniformly applied standards, which is the water course requirements and the uh, slope requirements that can allow development on this site without 
any meaningful CEQA review as far as I'm concerned. So that's a concern that I have with this project. Any other staff questions? No. no. Any other Not this time. questions for staff? So we'll one, sorry. Okay, Commissioner Sloman. Um, yeah, so the septic is unusual. Uh, you mentioned um, 200 feet to actually hook up to a sewer. Mm -hmm. Which direction is that? Um, I, I believe it's, I, I don't think the code talks about the direction. Um, it's under, I think, chapter six or title, title chapter six oh, of I mean, the municipal so there is code. no physical sewer to hook up to in there, 200 feet. That's the way there I is not. There's, there's a sewer connection in the Carbonera neighborhood. It's about the house that's about 230 feet to the west, but that, mm -hmm. that's still over 200 feet. And it's that they wouldn't connect a sewer line going across Bransaporty Creek. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't think and that's And then beyond a that, I think the city sewers a, a half a mile, or I think it's a half a mile down the road to the south. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So we'll invite any members of the public to address the commission on this. Welcome. Please sign in if you would, and you can sign in after if you like, and sh share your name if you're willing. Hello, I'm Frank Mena. I live two doors down from where this will be placed. And I've lived there for over 30 years, and during that time, this lot has been essentially abandoned. So over those years, we've seen illegal dumping. We have seen trees falling across the road that have blocked access to our homes. And we have seen the thickets of poison oak and so on developing in that lot. And when Tyler has come in, the applicant, he has taken responsibility for that lot, cleared out the thickets, cleared out the trash, taken and really made this a piece of property that is being taken care of, that someone is responsible for. So this has made an enormous difference for all of us living on the small dirt road that runs past it. So <clears throat> from the standpoint of seeing this become a property that is taken care of, that is somebody's home, that has someone that is responsible for it, it makes an enormous difference to all of us. And from what I've seen here tonight with the application and the way that this is being developed, it seems like a continuance of what I have seen from his behavior. Responsible, well thought out, putting it on pylons so that it minimizes the disturbance. Just everything I've seen about it, I'm very impressed. I'm very happy to see the possibility of this going in there. And so I really want to say uh, the degree to which I support this application, joining the lots, taking care of the situation. For example, the trees that you're mentioning, they fell across our road and blocked all access. We called Tyler up the next day he had people out in the morning cutting those up, clearing them from the road. And this was trunks 24 to 28 inches in diameter each, three or four of them completely blocking our access to our homes. He took care of that. He just made that happen immediately. So I have to say that whereas I might be very cautious about anyone else going in. I am very happy to see this happening. I'm really pleased with the plans that I've seen. I'm completely in support of it. And as I said, I live basically uh, probably 100 feet from where this home will be. So it will be directly affecting me. I want to see it there. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So I, we usually invite the applicant back to offer rebuttal if you have any of public comment. It's just one favorable comment, but uh, well, I will just will. say I really appreciate the support. Um, also, just I was reminded in listening to his comments about Tyler how impressed I've been. Also, this is um, you know this is a person who's building a home for his you know he just got married. He and his wife are wanting to move into a home. He's put a lot of time into designing this to meet their needs. And um, it's been a really 
like I said, a challenge as we were trying to create something on this steep slope, but also a really, um, really enjoyable process. And I think that we've come up with something that's really unassuming from the road, which was important to us to not have this big, massive structure there that also met his needs of a three bedroom home for him and his family. Um, and I, yeah, again, happy to answer any questions, but just wanted to comment on kind of the person that is behind a lot of this design as the client. Thank you. Bring it back to the commission for discussion. Mr. Singleton. I'm prepared to make a motion, but I'll and do so and uh, see if it's second and we'll have a discussion on the motion. Great. Um, I'd like to move that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the lot line adjustment, design permit, slope variance, and water course development permit based upon the findings listed below and the conditions of approval listed in Exhibit A. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, discussion, Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, I'm not going to support the motion. Uh, I have a question for staff regarding the comment that the city council must approve the septic system. Um, what is their authority about this project? What if they deny the septic system? If they deny the septic system, they're going to need to find a way to hook up to the sewer system. And you know, the question before them uh, is, A, does the environmental health department, is, are they supportive of this, which, which we know is true? Um, the other provision, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that there has to be some kind of a hardship. 200 feet is sort of set as the base. You know, if you're, if you're less than 200 feet, the expectation is that you connect. If it's more, you can apply to the city council for the septic system. Well, having been out there, I think the, you know, the staff determination on the uh, CEQA review makes a mockery of our regulations. I don't see how any project uh, can't be approved that has potentially significant environmental effects that aren't really even analyzed uh, sufficiently under the, uh, under the, the you know, the uh, uh, normal CEQA document. So I, I just, I don't, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, creating a substandard lot I'm concerned about having a septic tank so close to the uh, branch of 40 Creek. There's no information on the 100-year floodplain or in current years, the 500-year floodplain. I'm frankly surprised that the county has agreed to this septic tank um, right above the creek. I, I understand that there's a planning, uh, that there's a draft agreement with State Fish and Wildlife but it hasn't been approved. One of the findings uh, is that all the, uh, all the other agreements have been approved. I know that State Fish and Wildlife for streambed alteration permits usually uses the CEQA analysis that the uh, locals, local government provides. And in this case, it's, uh, it's not a, I don't consider it a meaningful CEQA analysis since it's a, it's an exception that's really not an exception. It's not even an exception. It's essentially the determination is that there doesn't need to be any CEQA analysis whatsoever because of the general plan and because of these various ordinances that supposedly uh, take care of all the problems, which instead of having mitigation measures are really just con conditions that without any public review, um, and I just think that this is, it just is not the way the CEQA process should, should operate. Other con uh, discussion, Commissioner Conway? Yeah, um, appreciate your thoughtful view on that. I don't see it that way. There is a CEQA document. Um, the reason it's in draft form, as I understand it, is that this needs to be adopted. Um, for the, um, th this exemption needs to be adopted, was that right? Uh, that's correct. Part, part of your motion would be to acknowledge the determination, which would... And at that point, the agreement that's been um, negotiated beca can become final. That's correct. Right. Um, uh, I actually thought it was a fascinating building. And um, I, I, I mean, like, it, I, I, I was... When I first looked at it, I was actually really interested to what, what you guys are going to say about it. Um, but the more I read about it, I mean, I think there has, it, it does look like it's been really thoughtful. I really appreciate hearing 
that um, this is an opportunity to really make the neighborhood work better. Um, and I kind of want to see the building, so um, I support it. Commissioner Spellman? Yeah, I support that that thought too. I mean, it's it's obviously been sensitively designed to the conditions that are there. I mean, it it floats lightly on that slope. Uh, there will be piers going down, but uh, the house itself sort of floats in the in the landscape, which is uh, I think very sensitively done and obvious attention to street views, which they didn't have to comply with. But the, the fact that it sort of disappears and falls down the hill is kind of an interesting idea. Um, yeah, encourage more unconventional looking housing. Other discussion? I have a couple of questions. Um, with regard, I've not, I've not, since I've been on the commission, we haven't had this, um, we haven't had a, a level A water course development issue. And so I'm, I'm not familiar with the process for um, the water course development <coughs> management plan, you're, you're saying we kind of punt on that because the regional board and DFW get involved? Or? It, uh, so the, um, there is an exception to the water course development permit for projects that require a permit from like a state or federal agency that have their own environmental review. So it's the part of this project that's below the top of bank that part is getting a permit from California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So that part is, was not reviewed as part of this water course development permit. This permit reviewed everything between the management setback and the top of bank, which is a little piece of the house and then the, um, the top part of that extended drainage. And then do you, do you task yourself with um looking at the stream bed alteration agreement that DFW has drafted um, to make sure that that is at least as rigorous as the city. Yeah, I, I, I looked through you, it and they, they had a number of conditions which I think actually goes beyond what we would have required probably. Okay. Um, Is there anything that the city can do or will do to, um, so how about, how about then after this is approved, um, what, what would, what I'm worried about is the creek. I'm not actually worried about the slope because I, I think engineers can dig into that bedrock mm -hmm. and make it all safe based on seismic studies and all that. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about the steelhead. Um, not very often does the city actually have development along a level A water course. So, uh, Level B stuff is, you know, not as valuable. There is yeah. there um, special status species in this creek, and there's not one big problem for those. It's a bunch of problems, um, and it's little by little we nickel and dime their habitat. So that's what I'm really concerned with this. So my question is, what after we approve this, if the city does that, then mm -hmm. there's there's no mechanism to go back and you don't go back and check to see if the um, the, the, the lot is managed in any certain way, right? Or um, inappropriate landscaping or clearing or... Well, I mean, we have a condition of approval for... Well, I'm not sure exactly how it's written. We, I mean, we have a condition of approval for when they, when they revegetate the site for erosion control that needs to have la native landscaping. Mm -hmm. um, So that condition and just, yeah. I mean, you don't go and you don't go back into back, people's backyard a year yeah. or five years later, I realize. So I think I know the answer. I'm yeah. just trying to think. Beyond about. that, there are water course development standards and there's a, a pretty specific list of things that would need a water course development permit in the setbacks of a type A creek. We're not going to go and make sure they're meeting all of those, but if, and this happens sometimes if they're doing something they shouldn't and somebody files a complaint that would go through our code enforcement process and then they would it's just code enforcement. clean it up. And, and, and it's happened yeah. Yeah, before where we've dealt with it through the code enforcement, mm -hmm. um, you know, through the complaint process. And then, you know, when we go out there and look at it, we're, 
you know, looking at the conditions of approval on this, and if they're not being met, um, we, we can use our code enforcement tools to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd also like to respond to the comment regarding CEQA. Um, just, just briefly, I mean, you, you, I know some of you who have been on the commission longer have seen these, these uh, documents uh, prepared, but CEQA does include provisions to streamline review when it's appropriate. Um, we think this is one of those situations, um, you know, we're, we're really not avoiding CEQA. I mean, the, I think Commissioner Schifrin said it itself, said himself, you know, we did the analysis through the initial study. I mean, some agencies, it's, it's, it's done so out of an abundance of caution, it's above and beyond, I think, what other agencies do. Um, the, the mitigations, the idea here is the mitigations are built in, not only with our general plan EIR, but through uniformly de um, development standards, uniformly applied development standards. Um, you know, if there is something per peculiar to the site, then we do, we can look at it through either a negative declaration or maybe an EIR. Uh, that didn't apply here. Um, we're, we're very careful in our analysis. So um, I, I, this is something that's, that's allowed in the, in the law. Um, we've, uh, we've sort of templated it with our CEQA consultant and our CEQA attorneys. Um, they, they've reviewed many of these. Um, we, we feel like we're on, on very firm legal ground using them. Um, and, and, and I will say they're, they're less susceptible to challenge in court than a negative declaration. Again, if it's appropriate. So. Any other comments? I, would, I will say that if, um, if we were to see this, this type of thing again, I would like to see the, the draft stream bed alteration agreement. Um, I'm, again, being really concerned about the habitat, I can't, as the city and this body, we can't tell the state to do so differently, but it, right. have, I would have some more comfort level with knowing exactly what's in there. We can certainly keep that in mind. And, and also for you, keep in mind, if there's something that you see in the report of reference to something that we haven't included, don't hesitate to contact us and we'll make it available right away. But that, that's a good comment. We can certainly attach those. Okay. So um, uh, discussion seems to have stalled and we have a motion and a second. So I will call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay, so the motion passes 6-1 with Commissioner Schifrin voting against, and thank you staff for that. Thank you to the applicant, and that's the end of our ag agenda other than information items. Are there any, Eric? Just um, coming up uh, at our next meeting, um, June 6th, uh, we have uh, the right-of-way abandonment for 517 High. You heard that a month or two ago, so um, that'll be coming through. Um, there's also an appeal of uh, a decision I made as zoning administrator regarding um, a medical facility in the Cooper House. Um, that's that's scheduled uh, for next meeting. Um, so that's what we have. And then out on June 20th, we tentatively have a community care facility on Mission Street. What's the schedule in July? Is the commission meeting in July? The, the yeah, council? there's only one meeting in July because the other one falls on the 4th, and, and I'm definitely not going to be here. <laughs> um, I think we changed that. So it's just, did we? I think we have it on the 3rd. We had okay. discussed that, I think. I don't have, I mean, we don't have anything right now for that meeting. Um, so. So, so that's, it it's, scheduled for, here, it's scheduled for the 3rd, and we may have no business. Is that the? Yeah, we may not need it. Okay doesn't look like we need it right now. Okay. That's so the commission doesn't take any breaks like this meeting year round. No. <laughs> I, I see where you're getting at. <laughs> we do cancel more meetings Line than the council does though, so <laughs> for what it's worth. Well, we did have that one long gap. For any while. other any other information items, Eric? No. Okay. Any uh, subcommittee advisory we're, we're we're not just quite wrapped up. <laughs> Any uh, subcommittee or advisory body oral reports? Well, I'm on this uh, Westcliff pack, and there are really two aspects. I didn't want to go that way. One is adaptation, what? and one is level rise. Okay. We, the point is, we've had the first meeting for the adaptation, and we're having a virtual first meeting of the beach uh, LCP amendment process at some point in the next couple of months. Next couple of months, okay. Thank you. 
Thanks for serving on that. And um, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.